and uh, but both have a role but clearly the cold is not a cold alone is not good enough so what brought us here where we are doing the arch replacement circulatory rest was a seminal work by dr grieb and and he was the one who really introduced the circulatory arrest. They performed the deep hypothermic circulatory arrest uh, by cooling down the patient to 18 degrees Celsius. And uh, it became the go-to approach for many decades. It was in 70s when Dr. Grieb introduced that. Subsequently, one of the, uh, one of very renowned surgeon, John Aleftriardis at Yale, who just recently retired and a good friend of mine, he published his outcomes of retrograde cerebral perfusion uh, with uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, let me correct myself. He, he publishes outcomes without retrograde cerebral perfusion with a direct hypothermic circulatory arrest. It's, it's called straight circ arrest. A friend of mine was trained by him and I was shocked when I grew up in, in ACP and he grew up in complete circ arrest with 18 degree. And their outcomes were amazing. John Alftiardi's name is difficult to pronounce. He would ask his patients to spell his name backwards at the end of the you know, post of day one or two. So that was just to demonstrate that the neurocognitive outcomes of a straight circ rest with 18 degrees Celsius are really good. So this was his data. And what, what Dr. Alftiardi has demonstrated that, you know, with straight circ rest, 18 degrees Celsius, you can perform cardiac surgery with great outcomes with a very low risk of stroke. You can notice a stroke risk is 1.6%. It's hard to beat that outcome. This was great. Yale published that and we practiced it for 30 years. But what happened was it stalled the progress of the field of cerebral protection. Everyone thought that we are content. This is great. But the problem is it doesn't stop there. Hypothermia has its own disadvantages. When you cool down a patient, it takes a long time of a cardiopulmonary bypass time. And the rewarming takes long. And then you have a coagulopathy to treat with. And there are many other disadvantages. But what he demonstrated that at the experienced hands, up to 50 minutes of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest is safe and without any significant post-operative mortality or neurological squalling, which is pretty striking. So this is the evolution of circulatory arrest. You can see that in 70s, 50 years ago, 53 years ago, femoral artery cannulation was a standard. Everyone will be you know, going through a deeper hypothermic circulatory arrest. Then we started doing ascending aortic cannulation and everyone started thinking that why can't we go to the warmer temperatures? Everyone likes warmer temperature. Too cold is too cold. So when you warm the body or you come to the lesser moderate hypothermia, then you have to come up with some adjuncts. So at that time, RCP and ACP were you know, accepted as two of the adjuncts. The most common method of ACP was either axillary artery, which was championed by Cleveland Clinic. Joe Sebek had the seminal paper which showed that axillary artery cannulation is much more superior with less risk of stroke. And Dr. Caselli, my mentor, he was the one who championed the innominate cannulation. The benefit of innominate cannulation was that you don't have to dig through the axillary artery. It takes another 25 minutes. And you can, you can literally encircle that. You can put a side biting clamp and, and you can sew a 10 millimeter graft. I will show you the picture of, of one of my case. And, uh, and it worked great. Now the problem is, is that simultaneously there was another group which thinks RCP is a great strategy. They combined RCP with deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. So Dr. Azamjan is trained by that group, one of Tony Estrada group. So they were simultaneous proponent and, and both are great. Both strategies are good, but let's, let's assess that in a more objective fashion, what works well and how can we differentiate it? So retrograde cerebral perfusion came from a concept. There are two veins in our heart, which doesn't have valves, and we can make use of both. We use retrograde cardioplegia all the time, right? How about the retrograde cerebral perfusion without valve too? It adds an option, but the question is, how much hypothermia is enough? How much cold temperature is good enough? 
traditionally people who are doing RCP, they all use 18 degrees Celsius. It just does not move the field up. You know, it doesn't change, it doesn't challenge, and you are still doing a hypothermic circulatory rest, but you are adding an adjunct. Is that good enough? Or should we do look into different options? And, you know, when you do RCP with circulatory arrest, you know, it gives something for perfusion to do as well. Otherwise, they're just sitting, doing nothing. So essentially, this was the paper. And, uh, you know, as you know, as, you know, Azam knows well, the Tony Estrella, he was trained by him. RCP became cultish, you know. It's, there's a cult there. There are four surgeons at, at, in the U.S. Tony Estrella, group at Cornell, and Hazem Safi's group, and a group at Emory, they were just doing RCP. Now, how do, how do you use RCP? Is just put a cannula in the superior vena cava. It's a right angle cannula. The, and, and you put the rumel tourniquet or umbilical tape above the azagus vein so that you can prevent the runoff of all the cerebral perfusion. And, and people who were doing it, they proved that based on early studies in 70s, that RCP is good for washout of emboli, washout of air, but it doesn't really provide any nutrition. And that was known that that's the disadvantage of RCP. Uh, you know, the other group from uh, University of Pittsburgh demonstrated that RCP at the, at the temperature of 22 degrees Celsius is safe. The benefits of, of RCP are simple. It cools, it washes out the debris, it's good for a short circle rest time. And it's usually combined traditionally but at almost all the centers by, with the deep hypothermic circulatory rest. Pay attention to that, deep hypothermic circulatory rest. So how about ACP? It usually starts with axillary cannulation. And, uh, and when the ACP was introduced, it created a rift among the surgeons. So there's a group which is using integrated cerebral perfusion you can actually perfuse the brain for honestly unlimited period of time. Would have great outcomes. But the problem is when you have an ACP circulatory arrest, you have a lower body ischemia. So you have to be mindful that how much lower body ischemia is acceptable. When it's more than 30 minutes, you have a high risk of paraplegia, you have high risk of liver injury, you have a high risk of kidney. So ACP, although it's good, it's not good for unlimited period of time either. There are huge proponents on both sides. This brings us back to Chad Hughes' paper. He looked into the proximal aortic arch operations using deep hypothermic circulatory rest. And he used, he had two groups of patients, with one with the ACP and another group with the RCP. And they found that the outcomes were very similar between both strategies. But remember, he is still using deep hypothermic circulatory rest. These are his outcomes. You know, there was no significant difference in the neurological complication, 30-day mortality, and uh, transient neurological deficit, clinical stroke, or TIA. They were very similar. This is our paper. One of my fellow, uh, Muhammad al -Dari, he actually examined that early on when I was a big proponent of <laughs> axillary cannulation or enominate cannulation. And we looked into comparing what, which one is superior, and we noticed that with axillary cannulation, only disadvantage is slightly long pump time, slightly long circulatory rest time, and slightly prolong, slightly increased blood transfusion rate, higher transfusion for platelets and red blood cells. Otherwise, neurological outcomes for both axillary and innominate cannulation were equivalent. So essentially, you could use any of the strategy. So now we are. And in and, and and U.S., honestly, this is the distribution. 21% people don't use circarest when they do acute type A dissection. 31% of the group uses circarest, and 23% uh, uses integrate, 20% uses retrograde, and there's a missing data as well. So essentially, we are all over the place. I'm going to move to a very important paper which actually gave us a pause and asked us to think more objectively. In ACP, our outcomes were outstanding. 97% freedom from stroke, 97.5. So if I sit in clinic with my patient and I tell him that I am, I'm going to do circulatory arrest, I will tell them your, your risk of stroke is 2.5%, which is extremely low, but not zero. So, so that's the goal. Our goal is to, to 
bring it to zero. Uh, this pilot study, it was funded by American Association of Thoracic Surgery. Brad Lashnauer is a good friend of mine. He started comparing that if we have an MRI data and have a neurological data, physiological data by asking patient a set of questions afterwards and assess their neuro functional neurological status. They had two groups with RCP with 20 degrees Celsius and ACP. Uh, and what they saw was, you know, the population was very similar. There was no difference in, in complexity of operations, in concomitant operation. Their circulatory rest time of note was 21 minutes or 19 minutes. So pretty respectable circulatory rest time. So essentially, all patients underwent neuropsychological testing preoperatively and post-op. And, uh, and then uh, uh, on, on, their, uh, on their testing, they assessed the patient for five scales, and there was not a significant difference. But when they looked into the diffusion-weighted images on MRI, patient who had ACP, they had significant, statistically significant microemboli to the brain. And, and not only that, the total number of microemboli were very significant, and the primary endpoint was achieved in 100% of the patients. The primary endpoint was differentiation of stroke. And this is what it looked like. And in, in RCP patients, the microemboli were extremely low compared to the ACP. We would think that natural flow of blood is going to the brain, but you are also not only flowing the blood, rather you are flowing the microemboli and you are flowing, flowing the atheromatous blocks and everything else to the brain as well. So what will be the long-term impact? We don't know. So remember, we were raised in ACP world. We liked RCP, but we were questioning what are the parameters they are using for the last 40 years. We didn't like those parameters, essentially. We thought, well, deep hypothermia, we, we don't like deep hypothermia. We have been using 28 degrees Celsius for a long time but we want to adopt RCP. Flows of less than 10 is not acceptable in ACP world. We, we usually use 10 to 15 ml per kilogram flow to the brain during the circulatory rest. And pressure of less than 25 was too low. And, uh, and the washout and cooling advantage is there, but we question the fact, the animal studies from 70s, which showed that RCP does not consume oxygen, does not consume glucose. And what, what should we do moving forward? That's the next question. You know, all strategies are good. Should we be using them? So it's really hard to know at that time, back in 2019, that which strategy is better. And we wanted to adopt some new knowledge. So we took ourselves out of our dogmatic beliefs that ACP is the best. And we really started to critically analyze our outcomes. The best way was to study the patients and do it. So we started uh, a study, and essentially it's a retrospective review of our patient with the aim to see the effectiveness and the neurological outcomes of RCP. In, in, and then also quantify the oxygen extraction. Because everyone say the brain doesn't, doesn't use oxygen if you have an RCP. Is it true? We don't know. That was, that was based on animal studies. How about human studies? Can we take the blood from a jugular vein during the circulatory arrest and measure the oxygen saturation from that blood and see how much is the consumption of blood returning back after the RCP, coming from the osti of the brain arteries, coming directly from the innominate and subclavian osti and left common clotted osti. So this was our study. Uh, we, had, uh, we only looked into elective hemiarches just to keep the data clean. This does not represent all of our aortic experience. This just is a very selected group of people who underwent elective hemiarches so that every, everything is comparable. Uh, we had a group of a previous group of ACP, which we have been doing for five years. And then we had another group of RCP, which we adopted recently. And we, we wanted to evaluate their outcomes, but the best way is in, uh, in, in retrospective studies to do a propensity match analysis and have a very similar, relatively similar in the best way possible, a population. So this is uh, the aortic aneurysm. So this was a cannulation strategy, direct aortic cannulation in the patient with the RCP, and an innominate graft, 10 millimeter innominate graft, suture to the uh, innominate artery, as you can see that, in the patient with the ACP. And uh, operative technique is such that we initiate the cardiopulmonary bypass, start cooling the patient down to 28 degrees Celsius. So moderate hyperthermia, hypothermia, 
SVC is calculated as I described, and we went up on the pressure. We challenged the traditional paradigm. We said, we're gonna keep going up on the pressure till we start seeing the return of the blood. And we noticed that most commonly pressure where we see a good robust return is not 25 or 30, it's around 40 to 50. The traditional uh, concern of brain edema and particular hemorrhages from the subconjunctival area, uh, area we, we only saw one or two patients where pressure by perfusion went up to 70. So if you have a pressure on 40 to 50, you have a very good blood return. Simultaneously, we measured the oxygen, uh, uh, blood oxygen saturation from uh, return blood. And, uh, and this is the hemi arch, how we, how, this is one of my fellow who, who's doing it in 11 minutes. And you can see this cannula, we are snaring this cannula. We're starting the circulatory arrest. Here is, uh, and this is simultaneously David Valve splitting root replacement procedure. This patient has Louis Dietz syndrome, and uh, that's why I use the felt, but generally I don't use felt very often. Uh, and I'm assisting him holding the graft. Uh, Muhammad is graduating. He's, uh, he's born and raised in the US, an Egyptian guy, very, very good surgeon. Uh, he's our chief resident right now. So start at four o'clock, parachute it down, and nothing uh, out of ordinary. It's just a standard hemiarch procedure. Uh, we try to invaginate the graft always, you know, uh, so that uh, our suture line is internally buttressed as well. He was not as fast as is shown here. So, but uh, uh, most of our residents are able to do the circulatory rest within circ rest time of 11 minutes. Five to 11 minutes is the usual circ rest time. We just uh, keep on harping them, go, 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 go. And uh, this is our end result. I am uh, de-airing, as you can see, the blood is coming out. Uh, circulatory arrest is re, uh, sorry, perfusion is reinitiated through the side limb and deliberate assessing the bleeding. He did a good job. There were not a lot of bleeders there. And, and when we looked into our outcomes of, we compared, we had 248 patients who had aneurysms uh, and, uh, uh, in SA, in uh, integrate 79, 80 patient in the retrograde. They were very similar cohort that, except that there was a significant in, uh, higher um, smoking incidence in the SSCP. And 25%, uh, one quarter of patients had a reduced anatomy. So look at the, looking at the procedures, these were very complex patients. You know, essentially 40, up to 36 to 40% of them had a concomitant valve replacement. A large percentage, 42%, had root replacement at the same time, 26% in the uh, RCP group. Our circulatory arrest time was 10 minutes in ACP and six minutes in RCP. So remember, this is really fast. Not that you know, you're beating your chest, just I want you to understand that this, is, this data should be taken with caution so you have to so fast in RCP uh, if you have a moderate hypothermia. Up to 15 minutes is very, very, very safe. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the native bladder temperature was a little bit warmer in the RCP. This is the oxygen extraction plot. It completely challenged the traditional paradigm that oxygen is not being extracted by the brain if you give through the vein. It is being extracted. We see the dark blood coming out. But we didn't know that, we measured it. We had evidence. We sent, asked the uh, anesthesia and perfusionist to assess the well, uh, you know, send it to the lab. And there was 93% oxygen extraction in the blood coming back, so which is outstanding. So it's not true that oxygen is not being extracted. Challenge the traditional paradigm. Uh, so when we looked at the, after the propensity matching, honestly, there was no difference in both groups, either in the patient characteristics or uh, or in the complication rate. So in conclusion, RCP pressure at the higher pressures than traditional, at the warmer body temperature is pretty safe in terms of neurological outcomes. And, and, and oxygen extraction is pretty decent. We just didn't know that before. And certainly we have to do larger studies to further assess the safety at the higher pressure. Uh, since then, we have adopted a shaggy protocol. We still love ACP as well, just FYI. So we don't completely let it go. So now we have become a little bit more selective in patients who have circulatory rest time anticipated 15 to 20 minutes. I feel very, very comfortable, a fast, rapid, 
RCP go. In patients where you anticipate the circulatory rest time is going to be 20 to 30, 40 minutes, we would still use RCP, take the benefit, and do the initial three to five minutes of flush. Use the RCP, run it, all the debris, oxygen, everything, you know, air is de-air, and then we go to the ACP afterwards. Uh, this is our current study going on. Uh, you know, most of the patients we have seen so far, they, there was no stroke in the shaggy protocol where we combined that. More results are yet to come. So this is the evolution now that the brain protection is with the moderate hypothermia with RCP or moderate hypothermia with ACP and RCP combined. And this is a trial with Chad Hughes is, is, has presented at AATS where he is going to look into the deep hypothermia, low moderate and a high moderate hypothermia and really look at more objective outcomes instead of patient waking up and following commands that we think that is sufficient, look into the neurocognitive outcomes and see really what's the impact on the brain protection. Uh, in summary, some degree of hypothermia is, is, is a cornerstone for all kind of brain protection. Hypothermia is good, but not good enough alone. So you have to combine it. RCP works well up to 20 to 30 minutes. Some studies show up to 50 minutes with a deep hypothermia. Hemi-arch is a perfect case for RCP. ACP is really good, more physiological. Embolization still occurs. It's not the best still. We have to acknowledge that. And when considering ACP and RCP, we have to understand that there is no single strategy which is proven superior. You have to tailor according to the complexity of your case, your anticipated circulatory rest time, and then choose to protect the brain. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. These are my mentors. On the left side is Lars Swenson. He taught me how to do ACP auxiliary cannulation. On the right side is Joe Casali. He taught me to do how ACP with auxiliary, with the nominate cannulation. And, and, uh, and I'm always grateful to all of my mentors. And thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, for me to come here and present our work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aftab. Very nice presentation, especially uh, about this oxygen extraction is, is very good. Now, my question is about the aortic dissection. What strategy do you use for the cerebral production? Now, for me, myself, I use axillary cannulation for all dissection because that gives me dual advantage, the arterial access as well as partial circulatory arrest as well. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, our strategy has evolved. In 2016, I was doing dissections differently than now. And all those things worked. I will just present to you what I do now. Nowadays, I do a central aortic cannulation under uh, ultrasound epiotic guidance for a type A dissection and start cooling the patient right away. If I anticipate that I will be doing a traditional hemi-arch, I feel very comfortable that RCP should be good enough up to 20 minutes. And and you will have a great neurological outcome. Up to 30 minutes, RCP does a great job. You don't waste your time on axillary cannulation. Patient has pericardial tamponade, you just go on. But make sure you have two things. Epiotic ultrasound to confirm the true lumen wire access and cannula. And if you have a TEE, TEE will tell you the wire is in the true lumen. If you do not have that, then go axillary. Uh, if I anticipate that I'm going to do a total arch frozen elephant trunk, I will do Exterior cannulation sometime, but it's my one of the least favorite approach. What I do is still do the central aortic cannulation and start debranching the brain. So my body access is still the central. You are cooling the patient. When you're cooling the patient, you're doing nothing. You're just waiting to cool. And you have an LV vent, heart starts to fibrillate. In that 30 minutes, what I do is I debranch both innominate and common carotid artery. So by the time we are starting circulatory arrest, we have a bilateral ACP going on then. So essentially, you kind of tailor according to your circumstances, according to your operative strategy, and, and, and you use, make use of all these approaches. You don't have to be dogmatic to ACP only, RCP only, depending upon patient's complexity and what you can do and what are your expertise and what you have in your hand. I want to hear from Dr. Azam John because he raised in doing RCP as well at some point. Yeah. Very much for a very interesting uh, 
I, I would say is like out of your comfort zone. Yes. You know, you challenge the traditional mindset. Knowingly, the other thing works. <laughs> and if it doesn't work. And ourselves too. We challenged ourselves as yeah, well. Yeah, this is, I think, this is very good. I think with the passive time, the more you become experienced, you like to challenge yourself and you go against the tradition, which is good. And if you prove that, that's even good. I, I think the, the technique of this integral cerebral perfusion retrograde, because we are uh, trained with the deep hypothermal circulatory rest and then retrograde and then everything changed to integral cerebral perfusion. So this is not good. You know, this is how it was evolved. Everybody is cannulating the cerebral artery, the, the brain vessels, and then uh, the complexity, axillary cannulation. So everything has been evolved and right. depends how you are comfortable in your practice, what you are comfortable with. Right. Deep hypothermal circulatory rest works very well, as you said. It still works. It works. And uh, I understand your deep hypothermic circulatory rest uh, temperature is 20? Traditionally, seven. To be honest, 18. I have not done deep hypothermic circulatory rest in seven years. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I think the, yeah. the, the, what you presented is very interesting. I think it, what it matters is, is how fast you are, your time. Hypothermic circulatory rest time is very important. Whatever technique you use, if you're fast, you get away, get away with a lot of things. So I think people need to um, adopt the fastest way of doing things. It's not you have to be extremely uh, very, very quick surgeon. It's the technique you evolve to do the anastomosis, and that actually speed, isn't it? It's Correct. like everything. You know, I would say that here. Let's be honest among surgeons. Joe Caselli and, and Joe Bavaria, the best aortic surgeons I have known and my mentors, their circulatory rest time is 21 minutes. So 21 minutes is fine. Yeah, There's sure. nothing wrong with that. You know, if it, in our institution, I'm a slower one among the two of us. My senior partner, Brett Reese, he is able to have our fellow so on in a seven minutes of circuit rest. He's kind of beating on them. Go, 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 go. I yeah, say, sure. I don't like bleeding. Let's put three stitches in the back wall of your aorta while you're on circuit rest and have a beautifully good anastomosis. As you saw in the picture, at the end, there was not a single spot of bleeding. But I take my time. I, 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 my usual circuit rest time is between 11 to 15 minutes. So our, our median time is somewhere between 7 to 10 minutes in our group. But really, in the bigger picture, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You have to have a good brain protection and you have to have an efficient, good, Hemostatic circulatory rest anastomosis. Seven minutes versus nine minutes versus 20 minutes, up to 25 minutes, it's, it's, it's not significant at all. So don't really get bogged down into the time as long as you can do a safe procedure. After the, uh, the, the, the flow you mentioned with the retrograde cerebral perfusion is around, what was the flow? You, so between 10 to 15 flow, ml per fast kilogram. Flow, fast flow, 10 to 15 ml. 10 to 15 ml per kilogram. With pressure of, uh, do you say 40? And we ask perfusion to keep going. Keep going and tell us the pressure. Now, here's the thing. Where do you measure the pressure from? You measure the pressure from the side port of your central line. So essentially, the side port of oh. your cordis is directly given to anesthesia. They are monitoring the pressure through that when we are giving the circulatory rest. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aftab, for your excellent talk. <clears throat> uh, he's uh, not just a friend. He's a dear brother. We trained in the, in the same... Uh, time 2014 <clears throat> going back 10 years ago he was with Kusali I was with Dr. Safi and Dr. Estrera and we were literally across the street and we had overlap of our training also and we still had this discussion he used to come and tell me that ACP is the thing and don't do RCP and he knows Dr. Safi and Estrera and they taught me and I just still follow them we kept on publishing papers after papers because we were doing EEG, we were doing cerebral flow, everything we were monitoring, oxygen, everything. And we kept on proving that RCP is as good, and especially the 30 minutes, especially for the new surgeon training, 30 minute cutoff is a very good cutoff to have in your mind. I, I, I admit six minutes and 10 minutes is like very, very, it's not fast, it's very fast. I would say 15, 20 minutes, a very good time. Up till 30 minutes you have. I still, I don't have the same numbers of surgeries here that I had in America, but I still use the same Safi technique, retrograde perfusion. And I have gone a little warmer now from 20 to 24. And I, if I do, if I think I just need 30 minutes, I use the technique. But I'm happy that you saw the light.
Yes. On a on a you funny note. Me after ten years. <laughs> after ten, finally, because uh, and Dr. Safi, if he was here, I'll tell him. I actually talked to him a few days ago. He'd be very very happy that finally Caselli's group is doing RCPs. <laughs> thank you, thank you again. It's a pleasure. Yes. Nine or ten centimeter aorta is common. They I, I don't know how how it is now in America. I have not been there for a while now, but it was same over there. Dissections, large aneurysm, because people were living in outside cities, never got tested, and uh, similar dynamics. I think it wasn't that different. Large aneurysm. That's where we learned, and I don't know what's currently the size is. Are you same? Unfortunately, <coughs> females are a significant disadvantage. Remember that the females are shorter, but their aneurysm is larger. A 5.5 centimeter aneurysm on a female who is 5'2 is different compared to a 6'1 male who has 5.5 centimeter aneurysm. So that aneurysm is significantly large compared to their body surface area. A lot of patients have aortitis inflammation of aorta, chronic inflammation which leads to significant calcification. My last circulatory rest case I did last week, 82 years old gentleman, I opened his aorta, I cut his aorta, all the anastomotic suture line area was calcified like rock. And I was doing the anastomosis and I was sweating. I said, gosh, this is going to embolize. So I suctioned out a lot of debris. Literally with every suture, the white plaque, liquefied plaque was coming out. So essentially I suctioned everything out. Then I put two large pledges to cover that plaque and flushed out the blood as much as you can from the side port. For almost a minute, our perfusion was saying, what are you doing? I said, we need to flush every debris out. Fortunately, he woke up without stroke. But certainly, cases are getting more and more and more difficult for us everywhere, yeah. and especially delayed cases, chronic inflammation, females are harder cases. We don't see the calcification much, but we see very, very fragile tissue. Uh, it's just like a cheese. And uh, most of the dissection which I have done is almost always more than 7 centimeters. Yeah. And 10, 11 is just... That's, that's true. You know, in, in fragile tissue, I, I teach one of our fellows one thing. I know you all know that very well for the fellows and trainees is when your needle comes out, just watch your needle. If you make a large needle hole, especially in dissection, you're creating another entry tear. So just go with the curve of the needle and come out gently. Don't be herky jerky when you're taking the needle out. And, uh, and I don't use a 3 I use a 4 needle. I don't know if this make a difference or not. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thab, again. <clears throat> I think so, uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions, but the interest of time, we'll move. We have very interesting uh, presentations coming up. So I'd like to call the next speaker, Dr. Shahab from RIC, well sparing aortic root replacement and hemi arch replacement. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Sahab Ahmed, postgraduate uh, resident in uh, cardiac surgery in RIC hospital. Very overwhelming and uh, pressurizing as well to be presenting in the company of such great surgeons. I'm just a postgraduate trainee. Uh, my mentor and my supervisor, Professor Anjum, is here. He'll be helping me out, inshallah. Uh, so once I submitted the abstract for this, I, I thought that we'll be pre presenting it in the Section Don't worry, we, we all are here to help one Thank another, you. okay? Thank Let's you so just much, present sir. your case. So, uh, um, valve sparing aortic root uh, plus partial arch replacement uh, case report. This is a small introduction about us. Uh, RIC, a hospital in the north of Punjab, having a great, uh, a large number of patients we are catering here in a number of uh, OPDs, angiographies, and open heart surgeries, more than 1,300 cases per year. Some important numbers to remember in our population uh, regarding aortic dissections. Uh, we have, uh, as per the data, we have 5 to 30 cases per million people per year in the U.S., which is 2,000 cases reported every year. Hence, if we compare this uh, number to our Pakistani population, we will be expecting 1,100 to 6,600 new cases annually. 75% of them are uh, 40 to 70 years. Marfans are in the early 40s. And the rest of the cases are in the age cohort of 50 to 65 years of age. 
surgical mortality of uh, type A aortic dissections is less than 30% and medical mortality is 60%. Whereas the surgical mortality of type B aortic dissections is 30% and medical mortality was 10%. So mortality in the first 48 hours is 1 to 2% per hour. As the time passes, the chances of mortality also increase. So uh, we, have, we had this young man who came to us in the ER. He was a 35-year-old gentleman. He was a farmer by profession, non-smoker, non-hypertensive, no previous family history. He presented to the GP with complaints of abdominal pain and chest discomfort. After evaluation by the GP, he was referred to us in uh, the ER. Uh, his baselines, his uh, uh, routine examination was all found to be normal. We proceeded with the chest x-ray. Uh, on the grosser look up, it looks like the x-ray is also normal. But if you look closely, there was uh, increased uh, CTR of 18 to 27. And there was an abnormal bulge at the right side. Uh, which shows the mediastinal whitening, early mediastinal whitening. ACG was also by and large normal. Um, in our ER, we always proceed with the echocardiograms of all the patients. We proceeded with the echocardiogram and we saw the dilated aortic root with a dissection flap on the ascending aorta. Aortic analysis was of 28 mm, aortic root 72 and ascending aortic, uh, ascending aorta was 81 mm. The uh, LV systolic function was good and the aortic valve was a uh, trileaflet aortic valve. So um, as per the findings of the echocardiogram, we proceeded with the CT scans. This is the CT. We can see a largely dilated aorta with a dissection flap here. So it was extending in the ascending aorta, and the baker's cephalic was also involved at the ostium. So after uh, the cardiologist and the cardiac surgery team uh, coordinated, we uh, penned down a plan for the patient and we contacted the surgical treatment plan and we discussed the plan with the patient and the family. And the following plan was offered to, to the family. It, we planned for a valve sparing aortic uh, root replacement and the ascending aorta and the uh, partial art replacement. And the um, operation was to be done via the femoral bypass. Um, with uh, selective integrate pain perfusion and with a very short circulatory arrest time as sir proposed. Expected mortality told to the family was 5 to 10 percent and with a 60 percent probability of event-free survival for more than 10 years if the uh, operation was successful. So we proceeded with the femoral cannulation. Femoral vessels were exposed, heparinization, standard procedure, femoral artery cannulation, meat and sternotomy. For venous cannulation, we went via the RA. Uh, coronary sinus was cannulated for retrograde del nido, cardioplegia first. Uh, bypass was established and hypothermia of 28 was achieved. Then the aorta was excised along with the sinuses up to the annulus, leaving behind the aortic valve. The aortic valve was found to be healthy looking valve uh, with the co normal coapting uh, leaflets. Um, the valve was tested. Uh, then we proceeded with the sizing of the tube graft. So we sized the tube graft, the Acron tube graft of 32 mm. It was anastomosed to the annulus, and we incorporated the aortic valve with commissures suspended in the tube graft. Coronary buttons were re-anastomosed. Uh, Brachiocephalic trunk was cannulated for integrated cerebral perfusion. Temperature after this was further lowered down to 22 degree, and short circuit rest was established. Um, here we are suspending the um, it would, uh, uh, we're suspending the tube graft and uh, attaching the tube graft to the annulus. So coronary buttons were anastomosed, and after that, the valve was tested, which was found to be competent. After that, we uh, proceeded to the preparation of the distal stump. For the distal stump, or the uh, which we said the partial art replacement, we uh, took a 26 mm sized tube graft with two side arms of 10 mm size. Um, and one was uh, the proximal end was anastomosed to the distal end of the previous ascending aorta graft, and um, one side arm was anastomosed to the brachiocephalic trunk. Um, 
the body was perfused via the second arm of the uh, 10 mm uh, arm of the new graft we, which we, we were using. The patient, uh, in the meantime, we started reworming the patient and the distal anastomosis was fashioned. Um, after that standard procedure, we proceeded with the de airing. Uh, clamps was removed, bypass was concluded, and the extra side arm which we used for the uh, perfusion, it was uh, it was obliterated by using the proline sutures. So outcome, uh, it uh, per operatively and uh, post operatively, we proceeded with the echocardiogram and CT autogram of the patient. Uh, the patient uh, was discharged within a week. Uh, he bled in total less than 400 mLs. Uh, echocardiogram showed competent aortic valve with trace aortic regurgitation, normal mitral valve, and good biventricular function. Um, on follow-up of two weeks, the patient was doing pretty fine. CT autogram showed good quality of aortic valve, and the patient was doing well. Uh, so after that, uh, we, uh, as a supervision of we were like uh, comparing the results of valve sparing operations and the composite valve grafts, which we use routinely in our system. So the results are uh, somewhat comparable. The Once we preserve the valve, uh, the patient is, uh, is having more benefit. Like there is less risk of thromboembolism, less risk of uh, warfarin-induced coagulopathies and other problems. And uh, so if you look at the result, overall survival is much better in valve sparing operations as compared to the composite valve grafts. The, uh, the chances of reoperation are similar. <clears throat> Late hemorrhage is also less and it favors the valve sparing operations. Mortality is also favors later late mortalities. 30 day mortality also favors the valve sparing operations. So uh, uh, we take the message from this presentation that whenever we can save a valve, we should save that valve. If we can save the native valve, and even if it's a di acute dissection and the aortic valve is healthy looking and we can save it, we should always go for the repair procedures, valve sparing procedures, rather than sacrificing a healthy looking valve. Um, Advantages are lesser bleeding, early recovery, no need for warfarin, lesser events like thromboembolism, hemorrhage, and prostatic uh, conduits and prostatic valve endocarditis. And there is no difference in the incidence of reoperation. So 10 years, after 10 years, a patient with uh, valve sparing operation will be doing much better without the warfarin than a patient who is on warfarin. And he, it's very cumbersome for the patient to go and check his INR done and et cetera. So whenever you can save the valve, please save the valve and do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. water. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, presenting your excellent results. We'll take two questions, please. Someone give the mic some. <clears throat> excellent job. A really, really good presentation. I think this is just a, uh, this case demonstrates that great technical skills, expertise, and good patient care can lead to very, very long, good long-term outcomes. And I would encourage, you know, all the residents and fellows to learn the valve spitting route replacement. I think this is much more relevant in Pakistan. It is, it's a complex procedure. It's difficult to learn relatively compared to Bentol but your patients will immensely benefit compared to the Western world. And congratulations on the great outcomes and, uh, and, and a wonderfully done procedure. Thank you, sir. Uh, great presentation. Um, I've got a question maybe to the people sitting in the front. Um, we get to do... Um, two to three cases like this a year because not very many people are suitable for well sparing operations. Often when you open them, you also end up finding some fenestrations and one of the leaflets is hanging loose and you, you feel it's, it's not going to be competent. Um, but sometimes you do have a very pristine well, the one that you showed. The question I have is that once you check the competence on the table, it's perfect. But when you post-operatively, you do an echo, you often find there is a mild AR. So my question to the people sitting on the sofas is what else can you do 
to help that trace AR go as well. Thank you. Oh, Fab, you won't take the question. I have seen that in my practice too. Let me, when I was learning how to do David Valve spinning root replacement, one time I asked Lars Svensson, looking at all the fenestration, I said, sir, what do you think about this? And he said, it's not a problem, small fenestration. If you see a very large fenestration, which is going to the node of Arnetius in the middle, that's a problem. Then your valve is not, because these are stress fenestrations. If you have a very small minor fenestration at the Kami shore, don't worry about it, number one. Number two, I will tell you a trick. And I learned it hard way in a patient, you know, I had a patient who had, I did a David valve spinning root replacement. I was very happy with the results. He had a central AI, very mild central AI. I oversized the graft. My graft was larger. I had another patient and, and Jabrin al Kuri taught me that, who had an eccentric jet. Now, if you see an eccentric jet, it's different than a central AI. A mild central AI is very well tolerated, no problem. Eccentric jet is a real problem. So you have to see where eccentric jet is. Systematically assess your leaflets. If you have an eccentric jet going towards the anterior mitral leaflet, you got two problems. Either the problem is that your right leaflet or the problem is with your non-leaflet. Now, there could be two scenarios. Either the leaflet is retracted or leaflet is redundant. If your right or non-leaflet is retracted, it's easy to fix. You can do a central folding plasty, assess that, see which leaflet is belonging. If it's right, fold the, uh, fold the in the center, or if it's non, fold that in the center. The problem which is not fixable is if your leaflet height is less and leaflet is four shorter. And how do you figure that out before you embark on the David? Take a ruler, a metal ruler, simple ruler, if your leaflet height is more than 19, in humans, uh, Joachim Schaefer's PhD hypothesis, or PhD thesis was on that. In humans, the leaflet in a tri-leaflet valve, the height is more than 19. If it's more than 19, you should be able to spare the valve. If the height is less than 19, you got a problem. It's a foreshortened, retracted, fibrous leaflet. Don't even try to spare that. You're going to have an AI, and you're going to have an eccentric jet. Last thing. If you do a David, you got bad AI, don't leave it. Change the valve. Now, how do you change the valve? Only thing I have done once. I admit that in my eight years career, I have changed the valve once. I could not fix that. That was my mistake early on in the career. What did I do? non pledged stitches. Don't put pledged stitches. You have already foreshortened your annulus quite a bit with the David stitches. You're going to make your LVOT or you know your annulus very, very narrow. So non pledged stitches are replace the valve. I want to hear from Dr. Uh, Anjum Jawa. Well, the, the first component of your question was about the suitability of uh, saving the valve. Uh, that's true. I started uh, this valve sparing surgery something like seven years ago. And I have the advantage of working in different uh, public sector large institutions. So we have a huge referral. So initially, um, I was doing like something five or six cases a year. But now most of the work I do is valve sparing root replacements. So sometimes it becomes 40 to 50 cases a year, uh, which is a large number. And th that's the reason we can train people. Otherwise, we, we are unable to train if we are doing only five or six patients a year. Uh, I agree with you. If you have to replace the valve, the time is short and you cannot go actually uh, by you know, following all those ri the rituals. But by the way, I replaced the aortic valve without pledged stitches anyway. Most mm -hmm. of our patients in Pakistan have small roots, and we are putting smaller size valves in many cases. Uh, fenestrations, as you have already said, the small fenestrations, they are not a problem. We always get mild or trace AR, uh, which is actually also dependent how it is assessed by the echocardiographer. So we need to have one echocardiographer for all these patients. If we keep on changing the person, every time you will get a different report. So there should be a very expert echocardiographer who can quantify the aortic regurgitation. Otherwise, they will keep on 
saying whatever you push them to say. So if you tell them, I bus normally like the you will say, yes, it is normal. If you say, I'm going to 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 say, Lesson is that you have to empower yourself in your team and you have to do it and reassess it. Trace AR is not a big deal actually. We have very good medicines to deal with that. And also we should remember if you put any kind of tissue valve, especially the pericardial valve, there is always a central trigger. And similarly, there is a trace AR in mechanical valves also. So there is no point of uh, getting uh, afraid of, yeah. Uh, th Thanks. That's what I believe in. Thank you very much. I know a lot of people use the plagiated uh, interrupted sutures, and uh, but the way I was trained with people, we, the dental we always use the uh, semi-continuous uh, to a proline because it's very hemostatic, so you don't have to have so many knots, just three knots. And because most of my everything does, I do uh, semi-continuous uh, with proline. I think that's a very British way of. I know you don't do that, but uh, especially with so the mic that are close current even with this valve sparing thing, I think the, if you put too many plagiaries, it just uh, uh, deteriorates the geometry of the valve. Sometimes that leads to leakage. So if it's a continuous thing, that helps. So that's how we are straight. So it's a, it's a great question. You know, uh, I, I still do interrupt it uh, for Bentol, for, for David. I go in and uh, in, with plagiarism. With pleasure for 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 Bentol, with pleasure for AVR non pleasure, um, and one thing I would say all the trainees, if you have a root, and this is the first case in your practice, don't try to do David. Do the Bentol. Your patient should be alive off the table. If you have a practice like Dr. Anjum Jalal, and you are doing already enough Davids and you do it routinely in your practice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very good question and discussion. I'm sure everyone's learning a lot, but we are running a little late, so we'll just try to quicken things up. So the next interesting presentation is a case series of aortic procedures from by Dr. Asan Mehman from Taba Institute. Assalamu alaikum uh, and a very good morning to all of you here. Uh, I am Dr. Shazad, uh, Senior Surgical Fellow at Bahad Institute. Uh, my attending Dr. Essen is here in the next hall as a panelist. So I will uh, take this. So this is a case series of aortic procedure at the Bahad Institute, Karachi, uh, in this special time of 2010 to 2023. So, uh, as you know that aortic uh, procedures are a critical uh, component of the cardiovascular surgery, uh, often being necessitated by a range of conditions. And this case series, uh, this study, uh, basically aims to provide an insight uh, into the clinical profile and uh, the outcomes of the patients who underwent uh, these aortic procedures uh, in Tabah Institute since this specified time. So a total of 217 patients uh, were included in this uh, data. And this, after collecting the data, uh, we were, they were analyzed for various echocardiographic and surgical uh, uh, variables. And the test also applied parametric, non-parametric data classification was applied to, to provide a comprehensive uh, understanding of the, uh, the patient's uh, population we inducted in study. So these are breakup of uh, the procedures. Uh, out of total 217 uh, cases, uh, we can see 41%, uh, uh, 90 of this modified Bantal procedures, uh, second by 20% uh, of cabbage plus modified. Rest, you can see here, 10% uh, AVR plus aortic root. And uh, aortic procedure plus case mix, in which uh, maybe the strikers repair uh, and some other uh, 
problems were dealt with. So we marked it's aortic progeny plus case mix. This histogram depicting the different age uh, we, uh, of the patients who were uh, included in the study. And as we can see here, uh, mostly the age is uh, between uh, 40 to 50, and uh, the mean was calculated to be 44.5%. This in terms of injection fraction, uh, it was uh, estimated that uh, uh, around this, this part shot basically depicts that uh, 40 to 50% uh, of the ejection fraction, uh, 40 to 50% EF uh, was there in most of these uh, patients, the frequency there. Here you go findings, uh, you can see here, uh, mostly uh, around 48% uh, of the cases have uh, severe regurgitation. And 30% we find aortic stenosis, well, more, and moderate regurg uh, was found, found in uh, around 15% of the patients. Well, this uh, equal findings when following to aorta, uh, almost 16% uh, uh, of the patients, 16 70% of the patients have aortic root aneurysms. Uh, approximately 20% uh, have dilated ascending aorta. And type A aortic dissection accounting for about 12 to 13 percent, and others which included uh, along with uh, this aortic uh, 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 problem with associated with the VSDs, MER, and the case mix, like as previously explained. <clears throat> so these were the comorbids. We have also uh, noted down the comorbids uh, patient having uh, coming to this uh, uh, study. So uh, congestive heart failure, we can see around 18 percent of the patients there. And uh, NYHA, NYHA class three to four, uh, sixty-two percent have fallen in this uh, class before coming to their surgery. Now, oh, this uh, of course, 50, uh, fifteen percent of the patient had MI, and around thirty percent of the patient uh, had angina symptoms. CCS class three to four. Uh, this, uh, uh, we have uh, some uh, patients, uh, mostly they do have uh, renal issues as well, so we evaluated uh, for their renal functions, and it was found that in this study, almost 34% of the patients have moderate uh, kidney dysfunction, uh, while uh, severe kidney dysfunction was found to be in uh, approximately 12% of the patient. Hypertension, uh, almost around 43% patient uh, in this study have hypertension as well. And 35% uh, approximately patient was done as an emergent or urgent case. Rest were elective. So uh, patients do get reopened, often after surgery. So we also have in this study patients who have been reopened. Uh, around 30% of the 13% of the patient was, uh, uh, were open for uh, bleeding, tamponade, uh, pending tamponade. And, uh, some uh, around four to five percent patient uh, uh, we have uh, followed. They, they had post-op uh, stroke CV. In hospital or within 30 mortality recall. So in hospital mortality uh, was uh, 14 point, uh, almost 15 percent approximately, or expired. Uh, rest, alhamdulillah, 85 percent of the patients they went home alive. And uh, this mortality, this is basically a large uh, 10 to 12 years data. Uh, since 2017, uh, we have aortic surgeon over here in our setup. So in our data, the mortality rate comes down after uh, uh, we started the uh, focused uh, uh, this aortic surgery, uh, dedicated aortic surgery program uh, since 2017. So it has fallen down a bit. But we have here collected the last 10 years, so we can see here the 14%. <clears throat> According to Euroscore, uh, we evaluate the patient according to Euroscore, expected Euroscore distribution. Uh, we found that 50% uh, uh, of the patients fall in the low risk, less than uh, less than 3% uh, according to the Euroscore. And around 33-34% were in moderate range, 3-9%. to Almost 40% uh, high, uh, that is 9-25% according to the Euroscore. And 4% around were in a uh, very high category according to Eurosco. Uh, so the conclusion is that uh, basically this case uh, study offers a valuable uh, insight 
and clinical characteristics and outcomes of uh, the aortic procedures, in particular to uh, this institution where we have collected uh, in this specific time. And the high proportion of uh, this urgent emergent cases, you know, are always made the challenging uh, uh, procedures. So uh, no doubt further research is needed um, uh, to identify the specific risk factors uh, that uh, potentially, uh, you know, in, in, uh, and, and potential areas of improvement in this uh, uh, field of surgery in this particular uh, uh, expertise. Uh, so uh, uh, patient care will be improved uh, in context with this uh, surgeries. The study then contributes, you know, finally to uh, main aim is to contribute to uh, ongoing uh, in uh, ongoing efforts, we are making all the cardiac surgeons around the globe in Pakistan as well uh, to enhance the outcomes in this uh, the challenging field of the high stakes field of cardiac surgery. Because uh, many other centers, if you compare in abroad as well, I was searching while uh, preparing this presentation, they do have uh, uh, this uh, 10 years, five years, six years, even two years that are collected there. And yes, two mortality do exist along with uh, all their uh, expertise. So we did uh, plan to have. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of a, you know, maybe in the near future we'll be having more uh, focus on in particular disciplines. So that's the start of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Azam Jan had to go to another hall. Uh, I'm Dr. Mazur Ayman. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, please, I'll have a couple of questions. You know, as we talked about this uh, retrograde and to this having to pull technique, so what were your experience in this? Uh, uh, well, uh, Uh, What's the current practice? Dr. Sini used to go for anti and if uh, he we get also, but uh, he's not, uh, but I've not uh, uh, seen him experience uh, in this regard, much of the cases. Yes. Sorry? If you could go to one of your slides where you showed that few patients had uh, ascending aortic aneurysms, the ones that were operated, and the others had dilated ascending aorta. How were you differentiating between the two? Isn't that supposed to be the same thing? Oh, no, uh, at the time, sir, you know, when we were performing the surgeries, uh, approved the patients, you know, because uh, prior to that, we have echo and TN of everything there. Uh, but when you open the patient up there, Mm -hmm. And there's a very slight uh, difference, but uh, you're right. It's not very much, uh, you know. So let's say if you open them up and you find it dilated, what was your cutoff? And how did you decide to, you know, replace this particular ascending aorta? Or was it just a visual assessment? Any plans for in that but regard? As far as I've uh, been discussing the cases uh, with Dr. Essen, they, they do it, uh, you know, they take the scene on the table if they go for it or they want to go for it or not. I think it's it. an aneurysm rather than dilated is a very vague yes. uh, term rather than so it's I think it's probably Thank you very much. Any more questions, please? Uh, and you, you know, dilated is just like which is not very aneurysmal, isn't it? I, I understand uh, by this. Probably he meant that it is not reaching the uh, definition of true aneurysm. So that's uh, something which is not normal. But it's not also cross the limits of uh, the aneurysm. So that's probably uh, is the reason you are using. That's right. Yeah. But need to be operated like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move on to our next uh, presentation. Uh, our experience of trans aortic extended wedge myectomy for Hokum patients. Dr. Anas Samad from Umar Hospital, Lahore. Dr. Anna Samad. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim My name is Dr. Anna Samad and I'm working as a senior registrar and assistant cardiac surgeon in cardiac surgery team, Umar Hospital and Cardiac Center. 
Before I move on to my presentation, I would like to tell you that uh, our team led by Professor Mazur Rahman has been uh, our pioneers in hukam surgery in Pakistan. And we've been doing hukam surgery since 2006 and from 2017 uh, onwards, we have maintained a database of our hukam surgery patients. And we have a dynamic team of professionals who have been doing in perioperative care and conducting follow-ups and you know, uh, conducting follow-ups and maintaining such a database that has enabled me to share our experience of transaortic extended wedge myectomy for hypertrophic obstruct obstructive cardiomyopathy. So what is basically hokum? Hokum is asymmetric septical, uh, septal hypertrophy that causes dynamic alveoli obstruction in the absence of coronary artery disease, valvular and congenital heart disease. And it's a genetically determined. So patient usually present with chest pain, uh, heart failure symptoms, dyspnea and palpitations, orthopnea. Uh, usually these patients are young and at, uh, athletes are uh, usually just more common in athletes. And uh, usually these patients present to us with progressive symptomatic course. And the mortality without operation is 15% at five years and 25% at 10 years. We investigated through trans thoracic echo, trans esophageal echo, angiography, ventriculography, and MRA. This basic, uh, medical management includes beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, and antiarrhythmics. Uh, septal myectomy is a gold standard and concomitant surgeries can be done along with it. That is myectomy and MVR or mitral valve replacement can be done. This is basically how we do the resection of the septum through a trans aortic approach. Other alternatives are trans aortic, uh, trans coronary ablation of the septal hypertrophy and and DDD pacing, that's ICD possibly. Why we require surgery in this case? Surgical resection allows us to achieve complete repair and relief of subaortic obstruction and under direct anatomic visualization. So relief of obstruction uh, with myectomy is immediate, permanent, and virtually complete. Uh, as I told you earlier, we, ha uh, we have a database of our patients in our hospital. It's a small hospital. Uh, basically, it's a private facility, uh, but still we have maintained a database from January 2017 to 2023. Uh, we operated upon 101 patients, and we divided them into two groups. Group A included patients with an LVOT gradient of 50 to 80 mmHg, and group B included patients with a gradient of 90 mmHg and above. So 90% of the patients had LVOT obstruction. And mid-cavity, uh, 11 patients had mid-cavity hokum. And uh, I would like to tell you about the source of referrals. So referrals were less than 5% from cardiologists, but we have a direct social media and WhatsApp groups through which we get influx of the patients. In these patients, uh, in 101 patients, 78 patients underwent uh, myectomy, 10 patients underwent myectomy plus cabbage, and 10 patients uh, underwent myectomy plus MVR, and three patients had myectomy plus LED de-roofing. Uh, surgical steps were median stenotomy, and we established the bypass with aortic three-stage venous cannulation. Core blood cardioplegia, mostly we use anti-grade hypothermia, 35 degrees uh, Celsius, PA vent, and right superior pulmonary vein vent was used, and topical cooling. Oblique autotomy is done, and trans aortic wedge resection is done. Two RV pacing wires, and we load the patient with cordron on pump, wean the, uh, from the bypass, hemostasis, and routine closure. Results of our study showed marked reduction in LVOT gradient from uh, in group A, 20 to 30 mmHg reduction in the LVOT gradient was achieved. And in group B, in which uh, the uh, peak gradients were greater than 90 mmHg, 
we achieved 40 to 60 mmHg of uh, LVOT gradient reduction. Operating mortality was zero in group A, and two patients died uh, in group B. And if there was improvement in NYHE grade uh, in these patients. There were patients were uh, having NYHE 3, 4 symptoms, but after the surgery, these patients had NYHE 2 uh, and they, they uh, felt relieved. And only two patients uh, went on permanent pacing. This is the echo showing septal hypertrophy. And this is end systolic LV angiogram at hookum patients showing LV uh, septal hypertrophy. This is how we do the surgery, standard median stenotomy and pericardiotomy. And this is the picture after oblique aortotomy. And these are the landmarks. Uh, the, this, is, this, this is basically the right coronary cusp. And this is the right, uh, right and the non coronary, uh, this is non coronary cusp. And this is the right commissure where, uh, and uh, behind this is the membranous septum. And if we uh, incise it here, we can we end up in complete heart pop. So this is uh, right. Uh, this is the right coronary cusp, and we're given in C and below this, uh, below from the middle of right coronary cusp and below the middle uh, of the right coronary cusp, we give two horizontal incisions and divide the septum in a wedge-shaped manner. Uh, this is how a wedge-shaped uh, muscle is resected. A video up uh, upload me. Excellent. So this is transiotic. And in this video, we are giving parallel in C and uh, we're using scissor basically for parallel in C and in the septum. You know, it's, it's a very limited uh, exposure, but you might not be able to see the resection, but this is the chunk that we have resected. This is basically the septum from the LVOT. Uh, in this picture, you can visualize uh, the uh, horizontal uh, incisions that we give, and this is basically the wedge-shaped chunk that we resect. After surgery, uh, we've uh, achieved decreased obst obstruction, decreased SAM, and decreased MR, and improve uh, symptoms really improve. These, uh, this is the muscle that we have resected from our patient in which uh, the gradient was, LVOT gradient was 113 mmHg. I would like to show the echo, pre-operative and post-operative echoes of our patients. This is one patient in, in which the gradient was 75 mmHg pre-operatively. And uh, after surgery, this patient has a peak gradient of 27, uh, 27 mmH, and there was a marked reduction in the peak gradients after the surgery. And this is another patient with a peak gradient of 155 mmHg, and after surgery, this patient had a gradient of 14 mmHg in the LVOT. Results of our study are uh, results of our retrospective analysis suggest that transaortic extended wedge myectomy is a safe and effective surgical approach for our hookum patients.
Any questions? Thank you very much, Anas. Uh, uh, please, uh, questions. Uh. Thank you, and uh, you have done very well for this hokum. My question is that what is your selection criteria uh, for the surgical hokum operation? Second thing, how much, how, how do you calculate that how much tissues you are excising from the septum? Basically, basically this uh, comes with the experience that uh, how much chunk we are going to remove from the patient. So uh, whenever we uh, expose, uh, whenever we do an oblique or taught me, uh, and uh, we resect the LVOT. Usually, uh, septum protrudes into the uh, LVOT and causes obstruction. So, when we, uh, whenever we remove the chunk, uh, we uh, we have uh, usually this uh, comes with an experience that how much chunk we are going to remove and how long we are going to excise the tissue. Basically, the majority of these patients are the ones who have been on medication for a long time. And they have tried all the things so that catch each other long time. So and sometimes antiretic drugs as well. And they have been investigated and uh, they've been just suffering with symptoms. And with the passage of time, the symptoms are going, getting bad to worse. And these are the ones who are actually roaming around and seeking for some treatment. So our criteria is the patients who are refractory to medical treatment. That's very, very important. That's one indication. The second indication is anybody has a, a symptoms and has a family history of sudden death in the first degree relatives, even if the gradient is around 50. People with 50 gradients sometimes don't have extreme symptoms. But if they have a family history of first degree relatives who have sudden death, then I, that becomes an indication. People have a high gradient, they are very symptomatic anyway. So people who are extremely symptomatic the most common symptom these people suffer from palpitation, breathing, breathlessness, but dizziness, dizzy spells. And there was a mosque uh, imam who used to pass out every time he used to get up from Saiba. So sometimes six times, seven times a day, they should pass out. This is a very, when they get to that far, that they become really dizzy spells and pass out, blackouts. These are the one actually uh, are very strong candidates. And people who have got a concomitant disease like mitral valve problem. Majority of these Hocum patients have some degree of mitral degradation. You cannot have a, a patient with the Hocum without mitral degradation. As you know, the anterior leaflet just sucked in as a hose effect. The, whole, the, whole, the blood goes through the LVOT tract. It just sucks the anterior mitral leaflet and bangs to the uh, septal wall where it causes fibrosis. So that's how the mitral degradation is produced. So majority of these patients have a moderate mitral degradation. So I don't deal with mitral degradation as a, as a repair or replacement. But if they have a severe mitral degradation, along with LA and large, more than 50, that those are the patients I do concomitant mitral surgery. Because if you don't do mitral surgery, their leaflets are very redundant. And you know, actually, mitral leaflet in Hocum becomes too redundant because of being banged with the uh, uh, septum. So these are the one. That's your first thing. The other thing is the, the section of that septal tissue. So once you expose the aortotomy and you uh, pull the, uh, the leaflets, and with the help of a swab on a stick, you press the LED area, you press it downward, septum protrudes right in front of you, if you're looking at that. So the people with a big septum, you know the measurement of the uh, echoes, usually more than 20, 25, little 30, 32 as well. So that septum bulges into your view. So with the passive time, of course, with experience, you make a line just next to the uh, junction of the right and non coronary cusp, make one line and then make a horizontal line below the ladder and then another line. So I go right down. So most of the people say that how far you have to go is always more. Which is removed 
very easy. So when you start doing the extended, move towards the left side, so take more chunk, and I now I start going more and more in, so I take a knife right down. I don't have a special blade for that purpose, so I use a skinny knife, a long handle, and go right down this way, that way, this way, and then hold with some instrument and then pull it, and then keep taking the chunks of the LBOT, and then you see uh, how big you did. And most of the time you take a lot of tissue, and uh, I have a collection that I brought it from MSD and show that a lot of patients have pictures of my key pictures. I, I can't wait. Ideally, the tissue should be weighed. Sometimes from this one, I'm going to start. So you, you know that how much tissue that you have been removed. Is that absolutely? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I noticed in your series that uh, five only 5% five were referred from the cardiologist. That's why I asked this question. And uh, sometimes if you use the minimal uh, Access surgery, this instrument, the long scissor, that is very helpful for that operation. Thank you for your answer. Uh, great presentation. I just wanted to know that in the comparative slide, you still had a lot of patients in which there was significant residual gradient left, you know, in the group B, uh, 40 to 60. 40 to 60 percent reduction. Ideally, the gradient should disappear mostly. I know there is some some dynamic um, you know contractility issues and there will be some gradient that you will see on a TEE but but the the residual gradients were still there uh, in both your group A and group B more so in group B second question is that um, uh, you did mention that in the group B or somewhere there were uh, a significant number of patients which had mid cavity obstruction 11 patients actually. 11 patients what did you do in that because the mid cavity obstruction cannot effectively be tackled through an autotomy cannot effectively be tackled and what was the mode of death in two patients why did they die it's very very drop in the LPOT gradient uh, what I observed is two people who have less than 90 gradients, majority of the gradient does go away, of course. As you know, it's a disease of the muscle. You can't take the whole thing out. What you do is you actually make a passage, a wedge, so that you remove the alveolar obstruction as much as you can do. The people with very high gradients, their muscles at heart is like a rock. You just, you can do this and they're just like a stone. So you try to remove, with the passage of time, I... I'm becoming more aggressive in terms of taking the chunks, doing more extended wedge. Initially used to take this one, but now I'm moving towards the left side. And I have noticed moving towards the left side and going right down, keep going down as much as you can do. And you remove more tissue and uh, with the rongers and all those things. So your gradient coming down. The patients who have gradient down to like 40s, even their pre-op was 120, 130, their symptomatic benefit is, is remarkable. So these patients are observed over a period of time. We have an echo done every year. The, there was no operative mortality in this group. Uh, the one patient died uh, in 30 days when he went home. Uh, we received a call that he was probably must have had kind of arrhythmias. That's very likely explanation. The other patient was the one who died about seven years ago. So we had so far been chasing all our patients. We have very close contact with these patients. People who were very, very symptomatic, they could hardly walk. They, of course, their survival could not be more than 10 years. So we, we, the longest one we have about uh, uh, nine years, 10 years so far. And a couple of patients died in about seven year time. Those are so, so uh, G please, and you. Mike, I think the difficult part of the operation is to decide how much you are going to resect. And that actually um, takes a long time to learn. And during that period, you may have high gradients uh, I think it's still better to have slightly higher gradient than uh, overcorrection and complications. But one thing which I have observed in recent past that we uh, at RIC 
had the facility of cardiac MRI. And cardiac MRI has made us much braver in terms of planning our operation. So the Cine MRI gives a beautiful picture of Hokum, and you can actually design your incision very accurately. And that actually gives you a lot of confidence when you are on table and gives you the accuracy that how much you needed to resect and how much you have resected. Uh, mitral valve repair, as you said, is most of the time needed. Uh, the other thing is to, during the follow-up, uh, we should have some kind of rhythm monitoring and uh, implantation of ICD if it is needed because even after correction of the gradient, the chances of having fatal arrhythmia are still there. So we need to uh, look at that for the sake of completing the treatment. Thank you. Uh, again, this is this is very important. This is not just a disease and not a correction of disease in theaters. It's a long-term management follow-up of these patients. Uh, we have a close relationship with our electrophysiologists. So people have uh, halter monitoring every six months to one year. So if they have any kind of rhythm problem, so we have a quite close follow-up. So they refer to the electrophysiologist and uh, uh, so they can be candidate. There were a couple of patients who had already ICDs uh, implanted before the surgery. And uh, so those were the one we did. We haven't required any ICD afterwards. Yes, there are indications of people, especially those who have VT or VFs in the pre-surgical area. If they have any evidence of any arrhythmias, they are more likely. I use Cordron. I load them in with the cardron at the time of surgery and give them for some time as well. Can't give them for a long time. There's no evidence unless you have a history of VT or VFs. That uh, you should be, did you do any with the left ventricular apical combination as well? Because I did that in a couple of patients and it was very rewarding. Uh, it does require a little, you know, bravery at that time. Uh, but because for VSRs and LV aneurysms, you are relatively used to of going, you know, uh, just by the side of the LAD. I opened that and that gave a great view of that mid-septum bulge, which you could take it out with impunity. And then through that small opening, you could see the aortic valve and aorta, and you know that you have removed the obstruction very well. That's a very useful technique you asked earlier about the mid cavity obstruction. mid cavity obstruction is a difficult thing. I appreciate that from the trans aortic technique, it's very difficult to get it. So the people I did, majority of them had LVOT component as well as mid cavity. So I try to go as much as deep possible. But of course, with the apical, either you go to the apex, which is the least uh, of a surgical option unless you open them apically. Um, so even their LVOT element, if there is an LVOT element, if that is reduced, you can't make a cavity bigger. You know, the whole compressions have a very small cavity mm -hmm. anyway. Whatever it is, bulky muscles and a very small cavity. If that cavity cannot be made, whatever you do. All you have done is basically make a little passage to uh, just let them have a more uh, symptomatic relief. Please. Well, as you know, majority of centers don't have transesophageal atrophy simply built in. Let's be honest here, okay? The facility is only aware if you call the cardiologist and you ask that and you raise that. That facility is not there most of the time. Yes, in the Western world, it is. And there are other ways to, to monitor the pressure in the, in the uh, above the valve and below the valve. You put needles and measure. That's very tricky as well. That's not easy. Um, we never have to go back because experience have noticed that you remove a sizable chunk and you see the, uh, the LVOT track goes up, it's right in front of you. Uh, they, 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 we never had to be offered anyone so far. Thank you very much. We move on to our uh, next uh, presenter, unless you go to the other hall. Dr. Haris Ghani from, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Faisal Amir from Lahore is going to present ruptured aortic abdominal aneurysm, a life-threatening emergency outcome of open surgical repair. Dr. Faisal Amir, please.
assalamu alaikum uh, and very good morning to my all teachers uh, i am dr faisal amir a resident of cardiac surgery from sheikh zayed hospital i am here to present a case series of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm under the supervision of my team leader dr akil sahab uh, the topic of my presentation is ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm a life threatening emergency and outcome of open surgical repair with or without use of uh, ct angiogram in patients have deranged rfts the purpose of this uh, case series is that we all know that uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm has a mortality of more than 90% if it uh, it is if it is being properly and timely operated uh, most of the cases reach to the tertiary care hospital uh, by the time delay and we have a uh, short window of uh, taking this patient to the operation theater Uh, the content of my presentation includes a case presentation, uh, including a history, clinical examination, and outcomes, and later on clinical discussion and question answers. I'm going to present two cases. Uh, both will be having different presentations, and we will use uh, will show that how, which modality uh, uh, for the investigation investigative purpose we used, and what intervention we did, and what what are the outcomes of these patients. So starting with case one, it is with CT angiogram. A 55-year-old obese male patient who is known case of uncontrolled hypertension, smoker, puncher, presented to us in the ER of Sheikh Zayed Hospital with pain in the left flank from the last one week. The pain was moderate to severe intensity, radiating from loin to groin region. Patient had an also discoloration of the left flank from the last one month, for which he was doing self medication. patient initially visited local hospitals uh, where he was managed for re, uh, uti and suspected calculi patient was then admitted in tarshikar hospital for the management and diagnosis of the cause of uh, recurrent uti uh, where his labs were done and showed that the patient had deranged rft and they did ct abdominal plane it showed that patient had uh, uh, it was an uh, incidental finding of having uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm but patient's labs were deranged so he was discharged and referred to neurologists and uh, nephrologists and urologists for the management of recurrent uti patient landed in uh, our setup in sheikh zayed hospital with this uh, ct scan which was done plain it showing had an aneurysm of 11.2 into 7.7 cm the uh, on examination we saw a patient was obese anxious look due to pain he was well oriented in time place and person lying comfortably on his bed he had echomotic changes involving left loin and lumbar region he had mild to moderate tenderness in the left region there was no palpable mass and there was no pulsatile mass a uh, routine examination in the emergency showed that patient hp was 5.2 his platelets are his platelets were 150 and serum creatinine was 1.7 in the er of sheikh zayed hospital which was 3.2 when he was in uh, mu hospital so our plan was uh, we had a suspicion of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm and we admitted the patient his baseline workup was done blood products were arranged and ct angiogram of this patient was done after getting clearance from the nephrology department patient this is the uh, ct angiogram of the patient showing that it has is a huge uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm infrarenally just up to the bifurcation of the aorta this is again a picture of uh, ct abdomen showing that uh, this is an uh, dilatation of the uh, aorta and this is a collection of uh, hematoma so we did for uh, we did uh, open surgical repair it was our plan uh interoperating findings were uh, approximately 2 liters of clotted blood ruptured infrarenal uh, aortic aneurysm and we had a proximal anastomosis infrarenally and distal anastomosis just bifurcation of the uh, aorta and the cross clamp was uh, 17 minutes as a whole of the procedure so this is a picture real time picture showing the uh, proximal anastomosis anastomotic site and this is a distal anastomotic site so by the end of this procedure this is a whole uh, graft placed and this is the this is the covering of the uh, aneurysm aneurysm dilatation post op recovery of the patient was very smooth he was kept on ventilator for next 16 hours and next week in the morning patient remained in icu for one day 
and he was uh, shifted in uh, and stepped down in the ward uh, on the uh, second post op day patient remained there his labs were routinely done which were uh, normal and he was discharged on fifth post operative day by consulting the general surgeon for the removal of the drains which were removed uh, in the opd so these were the labs uh, which we got uh, just after the uh, just before discharge of the patient showing uh, the hp got improved or uh, rfts got improved uh, this is the real time picture of the patient uh, this is the first post operative day patient in the icu and this is the picture uh, the, when he came to us in opd on the uh, 21st uh, 22nd day of uh, his surgery drains were removed wound was clean patient is healthy and well so follow up of his patient was done routinely uh, ultrasound done after 3 months and repeat ct angiogram was done uh, after 6 months we showed that the graft is patent and working so this is a post operative uh, this is a pre operative uh, radiograph of uh, ct of the patient showing that the uh, dilatation of the aorta and this is a graft place here uh, this is a graft place here showing that it's patent graft and the patient is still healthy and enjoying his life so this coming up to the case 2 it is without ct angiogram uh this patient also is, is an old patient as a male patient a uh, known case of uncontrolled diabetes hookah smoker cigarette smoker of two packs for the last 40 years presented in er with complaint of ab pain abdomen and distension moderate intensity continuous reading to back and patient had absolute constipation and bilious vomiting for the last two days patient initially visited dhq hospital in somewhere sialkot where he was diagnosed and labeled as a case of acute abdomen he was then referred to a tertiary care hospital in lahore uh, for the workup of uh, acute uh, treatment workup of acute abdomen because as no general surgeon was available over there in the tertiary care hospital here lahore uh, his ct abdomen plane was done and uh, there was uh, uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm in the ct so uh, it was decided to refer the patient to the general uh, vascular surgeon uh, patient then landed to us uh, in uh, sheikh zaid hospital on examination an anxious looking patient due to pain and ng tube with gcs 15 by 15 having paler on uh, look and uh, tachycardic patient was being resuscitated over there in the tertiary care hospital that's why his vitals were maintained specific abdominal uh, examination showed patient uh, had in chymotic changes involving left lumbar region more than the right uh, abdomen was tender, tense and tender there is a hard there was a hard pulse style mass uh, that was palpable in the abdomen uh, infra umbilical uh, there was shift, shifting dullness and bowel sounds were absent among the labs significant labs showed the patient was anemic uh, he had an hp of 6.3 and metacrit of uh, 33 and uh, serum creatinine was 2.7 patient was admitted in uh, cts department uh, with a uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm after uh, clearance from the general surgery department his hp was done uh, his uh, 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 blood prox were arranged and paxil were transfused patient ct was patient had only uh, this these films uh, when he came to us uh, in sheikh zaid hospital his uh, contrast was not done due to range uh, rfts so we discussed this case with the um, nephrologist and we had no option just to operate uh, without doing any ct uh, with contrast investigation so uh, we planned for uh, endovascular and there was no endovascular surgeon was available in the town at that time so emergency uh, open repair was done uh, to save the bowel from the compression pressure of the ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm so general was general surgery department was to come board for the multidisciplinary approach so uh, the intraoperative findings were ruptured fusiform postolateral and infrarenal uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm there was a clotted blood of 2 liter severely atherosclerosed inferior mesenteric artery uh, the grafts were placed uh, one is the aorto ileic graft uh, to the left common and the second was the tubo ileic graft which is the right uh, external carotid artery uh, external ileic artery the clamp time of procedure was as a whole 37 minute Uh, post procedure patient had uh, no disturbances in the right limb so his embolectomy was done on table to save the life of, uh, to save the limb so uh, these are these are the uh, real time pictures of the patient showing a concealed hemorrhage of the uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm 
so it was open uh, clot was drained so this is a picture showing uh, uh, tubo left uh, common alley graft this is the proximal end this is a distal end this is a graft as a whole uh, as we don't have a good uh, uh, anchor site for the anastomosis of uh, on the right side of the uh, common no, common ileic artery so we did a tubo ileic uh, anastomosis here is a tubo ileic graft this is a proximal in the aortic aorta, uh, graft and the distal in the left uh, external uh, right external ileic artery patient again was uh, kept on some uh, ventilator for the next 6 hours as he, he gets better and uh, he was weaned off in next morning patient was extubated smoothly and there was uh, eventless uh, extubation patient was uh, rem uh, drains were removed on the fourth post operative day in the icu uh, this is a picture of the patient real time in the icu so his limb is also safe apart from his uh, aneurysm so post of lab shows that the hp was normal and the serum creatinine was uh, also normal uh, post operatively patient was stepped down in the ward on the fourth post operative day where his uh, ultrasound was done and his doctor uh, was done uh, the lower limb which was also normal patient was healthy mobile and was discharged on ninth post operative day from the ward in good health these are the follow up labs of the patient showing his hp is 12.12 uh, uh, 12 gram and urea creatinine as normal the color doppler showed that bilateral uh, uh, arteries are uh, patent and patient has mild uh, peripheral artery disease this is a ct angiogram which was done post operatively the patient showing that uh, this is a patent graft uh, this is a tubo left common ileic graft and uh, in the line in this picture you can see this this is a tubo left common and this is a uh, this is the aorta left common and this is a tubo right uh, external uh, external ileic artery graft so this is patent and patient is uh, good so both of our patient are alhamdulillah fine it's more than a year they are in follow up uh, so, so the purpose of this presentation is or the uh, presenting the case here is that both of these cases have abdominal rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm the nature of presentation of both cases were different that uh, in the second case it was acute rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm having a compression pressure in uh, compression pressure on the abdomen causing uh, the risk of the bowel so though both the patients had deranged rfts both patients were misdiagnosed and were referred from the tertiary uh, care hospital for the uh, ct angiogram so what we did uh, we uh, opt the patient uh, surgery uh, open surgical repair was done the similar outcome uh, came uh, uh, having the rft came back to normal and uh, both patients were discharged in good health uh, in uh, so coming up to the conclusion that no doubt though ct angiogram is a gold standard for abdominal aortic aneurysm but ct angiogram does not significantly have significant impact on the surgical outcome of the patient having rupture of abdominal aortic aneurysm so time delay by doing extensive and time consuming investigations can be avoided depending upon the nature of the presentation so thank you very much any questions, any questions please everybody is stunned thank you very much very kind you have to bear with me for a few minutes as Dr. Mazar has stepped out. Um, there's nothing more devastating than uh, a penetrating cardiac injury. And we have Dr. Haris Ghani from Punjab Institute of Cardiology, Lahore, to uh, dwell on this. His topic is penetrating cardiac injuries, carry a grave prognosis. Dr. Haris. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Haris and I'm a resident cardiac surgeon at Punjab Institute of Cardiology. And today I'm going to present a case of firearm injury presented initially presented at Services Hospital Lahore on eve of 14 August. Ali Raza, 26-year-old patient, resident of Narowal, was on a visit of Lahore City when on eve of 14th August, he was hit by a stray bullet on his chest when he was lying on his roof. 
Incidentally, this patient already had an aortic valve disease and was awaiting aortic valve replacement. Patient was referred from Services Hospital Lahore to Punjab Institute of Cardiology on ground of cardiac injury. This was his file, and in 2021, he was advised early AVR with plus minus root replacement. Patient was hit by a stray bullet on his chest when he was sleeping on his roof four hours back. Site of entry wound was interior chest, about two centimeter above and lateral to the sternum, measuring about one into one centimeter. There was no exit wound. There was no history of loss of consciousness. Past medical history, he was advised aortic valve uh, replacement surgery in 2021. Past surgical history was not significant. Family history, no family history of any cardiac disease. Patient was a non-smoker and was a salesman in a local company. Whitely, he was stable at the time of presentation, maintaining BP. Heart rate was 125 and afebrile. Patient was well oriented in time, place, and person. This initial video was made at Services Hospital. So this was the site of entry. Two centimeter below and lateral to the sternum. Physical examination, CVS, no added heart sound, no diastolic, with diastolic murmur. Normal vesicular breathing, soft abdomen sounds were tender. GCS was 15 by 15. His HB was 11.7 at time of presentation. Cardiac enzymes were uh, raised. CPK was 947 and CKMB 52. Bedside echo done at Punjab Institute of Cardiology showed good LV function. Mild pericardial effusion posteriorly and laterally, and couldn't find any foreign body in any cardiac chamber, the cardiologist at the time. This was previous echo done in 2021. There was fair AR with AR4 plus, huge dilated LV with fair LV systolic function. LV IDD was 74, ejection fraction was 50%, aortic root was 42. Annulus of 33 and this LVIDD 74 and IDS of 46. This was gated aortogram done in back in 2021. Mildly dilated aortic root, thickened calcified trial leaflet, non copting aortic valve, dilated LV with good LV function, and EF of 61% was. This was the X ray done in Punjab Institute of Cardiology showing bullet. This was CT scan done at Services Hospital, which shows large pericardial effusion. This one. This was fluoroscopy done, showing a foreign body moving within the cavity. Nishan measurement done at Punjab Institute of Cardiology. After receiving the patient in ICU, supplemental oxygen was started, IV fluids, central units and A-line was passed, follies catheterization, and patient was immediately shifted to the cardiac OT. Coming towards the intraoperative finding, a moderately contracting heart, 700 to 800 ml of frank blood was in pericardial cavity. Entry wound was located about 2 cm above the Zephy sternum along the left parasternal border. There was rent in RV cavity. Thickened myocardium, hypertrophic heart, thin wall, dilated aorta, and thick calcified non copting aortic valve. So this was doing pericardiotomy and the tempo nod was relieved. Mm -hmm. 
So this was the RV rent. We have post op inter repaired using flagellated stitch. Now coming towards the procedure. After aseptic measure, median stenotomy was done, and 7 to 800 ml of blood was drained. Full dose heparin given, aortic and double venous cannulation was done. Cross clamp applied, heart fibrillated, aortotomy done, cardioplegia given through the coronary osteas. RA opened, RA cavity explored for foreign body. Tricuspid valve assessed, RV cavity searched for foreign body. Soft rubber Nelton probe inserted through the rent which was under the cordy of the tricuspid valve about the size of three to four millimeter probe traced in LV cavity. So the uh, tract of the bullet was traced using the Nelton. Interventricular septum open, LA cavity assessed for foreign body, mitral valve assessed, LV cavity assessed. Foreign body was felt and entrapped between the muscle fibers of interventricular septum. Bullet retrieved gently by blunt manipulation with fingers by reaching inside for an object was grasped with Russian forceps and retrieved out of LV cavity. Intraventricular septum repaired using continuous proline 4 Tricuspid valve was again reassessed. RA closed using proline. Degurgitant aortic valve excised and replaced with 2729 mm onyx mechanical valve using 12 interrupted plagiated 13O ethibond sutures. Toyota closed and continuous using proline 4O. De-airing done, CPV off smoothly, decannulation done, cannulation sites reinforced, and routine wire cloyer was done. So this was a tract of the bullet showing tricuspid valve, the body of the tricuspid valve and penetrating into the interventricular symptom and reaching the LV cavity. Patient recovered well in ICU and was discharged on fifth post-op day with INR of 2.9. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, please. <coughs> There's some magic in the presenters, you know. No questions. <laughs> so, um, just uh, taking, um, you said that this patient had a possible aortic uh, root replacement as well, but I suppose because of the gravity of the situation and that the ascending aorta was not too dilated, you you just yeah. So you just embarked on uh, on aortic valve replacement. Very well done. Oh, you were there. When we talk about a bullet in the heart or bullet in the chest, but it is extremely difficult thing to do on table. Uh, finding out a foreign body, finding out a bullet is not an easy task. And especially if you have not done the CT scan, it's unlikely you will be able to find it. It's so difficult. And uh, at times we had to open more than one chambers uh, to reach to that. A particular bullet and most of the time it is embedded in the muscle so uh, it's not an easy thing uh, it's not as easy as it appears from presentations so, so the in interventricular septum uh, where did you open it well if you have to go through uh, that's what I'm saying you may have to open more than one chamber in this case they opened the left atrium and then probably squeezed the ventricle and then with the digital palpation inside the LV, they could find out the, the bullet. Otherwise, it was not visible from any source. But Anjum, the, in the operating notes, it was mentioned that uh, the interventricular septum was opened and then repaired with continuous foroproline. I don't sutures. know. I don't know about that. So from which side? From the right ventricle, probably, because he, he said that they probed the track from the right ventricle into the septum into the left ventricle. And that's probably where they, through the RA, they repaired the uh, rent in the ventricular septum. And then with squeezing of the, the ventricular septum and LV and putting a finger inside the LV, they could find it. Otherwise, through the aortic uh, uh, route, they were unable to localize it. Uh, I have uh, tried a few times very innovative things without any success. For example, once I put a bronchoscope in, 
rigid bronchoscope inside the LV through the aortic root. We couldn't find it. Yeah. So it's always difficult. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Aftar. It's a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I would say that, as uh, you know, as Dr. Anjum Jalal said, uh, in vascular and cardiac structure, it's hard to find the foreign body. I had a patient very similar to this, but a little different. The foreign body was in the aorta. So, and it was it was not from bullet. It was uh, she swallowed a, br a brush, barbecue Brussels brush, and she kept on pushing it and pushing it after a barbecue. So, be careful if you have a barbecue and you have metal Brussels. So, you got to be careful. So, and she came to us with a pus in the chest, and uh, I opened her chest. I was prepared for thoracoabdominal access, and I got femoral arterial access just in case of her aorta ruptured. So I mobilized the esophagus. I'm trying to find a foreign body, which is very visible on the CAT scan in the descending aorta, and I couldn't find it. I did an epiotic ultrasound. I couldn't find it. So then I used an intravascular ultrasound, and intravascular ultrasound was able to demonstrate that, okay, it's literally at the diaphragm. And I was externally able to put extrinsic pressure to determine that. And then I started open the opening up the linear, in a linear fashion, the entire aortic wall for two centimeter. And uh, we had a pericardial pledges ready. And as soon as we pulled it out, just, of course, the aorta is gonna start rupture bleed. And we put the stitch back quickly. So essentially it's a very, very tricky thing to do. So, you, but you have to be prepared as Dr. Jalal was saying in your case as well for all the audience to think out a box to find your foreign body. Foreign bodies are tricky, they will hide and they will, they will trick you. Well, great job, by the way. Thank you. So we move ahead, and uh, it is the era of women empowerment, and I have a pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Hina Inam, a delightful colleague from a prestigious institute, Aga Khan, and she will talk about outcomes of combined coronary artery bypass grafting with carotid and arterectomy. Dr. Hina. Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Dr. Hina Inam. I'm from Al Khan. I'll be presenting my outcomes of combined coronary artery bypass grafting and carotid endarterectomy. This is a single center study from a tertiary hospital in Pakistan. I have nothing to disclose. So we talk about cabbages. We know it's a very safe procedure. It's known for its favorable outcomes. However, successful patient recovery can be hindered by post-operative strokes. The incidence of strokes in cabbages can vary between 1.3% to 4.3%. In severe carotid artery stenosis, the stroke rate can go up to 7 to 11%. People who undergo cabbages can, and those who have um, severe carotid artery stenosis can go up to 6 to 8%. If we talk about the history of carotid endarterectomy, Hunt in 1914 emphasized carotid artery disease as a possible cause of stroke. E. Scott and Rob performed the first carotid endarterectomy in 1954. Favlaro popularized cabbage in 1967, and a combined approach containing both cabbages and carotid endarterectomy was first reported by Bernhard in 1972. So we talk about the treatment options. There's several treatment options available, including the stent placement, a stage procedure, which includes carotid endarterectomy with a cabbage, a reverse stage procedure, which includes doing a cabbage first, followed by a carotid endotectomy, and a synchronous procedure. All of these have their own pros and cons. Here you can see a, carotid endo, a very stenosed carotid artery, and this is what comes out of a carotid artery once you do a carotid artery endotectomy. This is the plaque that comes out. If you talk about my study, um, this was a retrospective observational study conducted at Aachen University Hospital, it was done between the periods of 1994 to 2021. ERC approval was sought. We did the data analysis using the SPSS version 24. Descriptive analysis was carried out using frequencies and percentages, while continuous data was described in medians and interquartile ranges. We included all adult patients who underwent cabbage plus carotid endotrectomy with carotid artery stenosis of more than 80%. Symptomatic patients and asymptomatic patients. 
We excluded hemodynamically unstable patients, unilateral 100% stenosis, and patients at high risk of cardiogenic embolism requiring anticoagulation. Coming to our results, we had a small sample size of 38 patients, um, majority of which were just um, males, 81.6%. The majority of these people had hypertension with percentage of 97.36%, followed by ischemic heart disease and diabetes mellitus. 52.6% of these patients had a bilateral carotid artery disease. 73.68% of these people were asymptomatic. Almost 90% of these cases were done electively. As far as the carotid closure technique was concerned, 92% of these were primarily closed, with the patch being used in only 7%. About 82% of these cases had the use of carotid chunts. As far as the complications are concerned, the majority of people, um, or the complications that we had was AFib, which was in 5.26%, followed by VFib, TIA, and bleeding. We had only three readmissions in the last 30 days. Uh, one was for hypertension, another was for diarrhea, another was for generalized weakness. Um, a 30-day all-cause mortality was zero. The length of intubation was 24 hours, and the longest length of ICU stay was 60 hours. So we come to the discussion. The, the treatment strategy remains the subject of debate. There's a controversy whether to do it synchronously or staged. A lot of studies have been done. They've been single center studies, they've been randomized control trials, but none of them have come to a consensus. Um, Del et al. compared stents using stage procedure, and in his study, he, he only showed 2% stroke risk. Levy et al. showed a comparison between stent and stage procedures and said that there was perioperative mortality rate of 3.7% and stroke of 2.5%, which was comparable in both. Gnapolis stated stent and synchronous procedures saying that there was no significant difference in rates of perioperative stroke, TIA, and MI between these groups. Zumas et al. compared stage with synchronous procedure. Um, as per his study, this was a meta-analysis done. It showed the risk of MI was relatively lower in patients who underwent combined cabbage and CEA than in a staged approach. However, the 30-day post-operative mortality and stroke is higher in synchronous group as compared to the stage group. Bucks et al., which is the only study done from LUMS, uh, stated a mortality rate of 6.6% in patients who underwent combined procedure. As far as my study is concerned, we had a low rate of mortality, low rate of post-operative morbidity. This is the so second only study done on this. Our findings may serve as a springboard to generate further discourse in this field to optimize the treatment. Yes, this was a single center study, and yes, we did have a small sample size. Um, in conclusion, in patients with concomitant carotid and coronary artery disease, a variety of different treatment modalities have shown a spectrum of results. The high risk of post-operative stroke after cabbage in patients with carotid artery disease is well known and may be safely mitigated by performing a combined cabbage and CEA procedure, which has shown favorable results in our center's experience. There is a need of prospectively conducted high-powered RCTs to conclusively determine whether the combined approach is significant, more efficacious, and safer relative to the other treatment modalities available. Further research is required to optimize the treatment of concomitant carotid and coronary artery disease, especially in Pakistani settings. Thank you. Questions, please. My name is Dr. Keel from Department of Cardiac Thoracic Surgery, Sheikh Jada Hospital. My question is how you are going to differentiate if you mention 2.5% of your patient had TIA and how they got the TIA from the cardiac disease or from the carotid and diatectomy? How you are going to differentiate? Interesting question. Um, I am sure that's difficult to differentiate whether they got it from my operation or the operation that my colleague did from the vascular side. Um, but um, 
what we did was we involved neurology, made sure that this wasn't a complete stroke, did an ECG, did an EEG, made, making sure that this wasn't anything um, that has progressed the disease, um, checked the carotids, checked, checked our um, ECGs. If there weren't any changes in the ECGs, the patient was doing well. That is all. But I don't think so we'll be able to differentiate whether it was them or us who did this. Congratulations on your outcomes, really good outcomes, by the way. Uh, so what's your algorithm right now at AKU for combined procedure? So what we do is we open the chest, um, take out the grafts, the vascular comes in, does the neck, um, do the procedure, then we continue complete our cabbage, and then that's how we do it. Algorithm for decision that this patient would need a combined procedure whereas this that patient would need a staged procedure. We usually do a combined procedure. Uh, we've stopped doing staged now. Great. Well, you know, I, I think uh, uh, this is great. What, what, what Your outcomes are amazing. This is a board question for American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Yes. That's why I, I asked this question. And in ABTS, uh, the, the classic teaching is whichever disease is symptomatic. Worse or yeah, symptomatic, yes. Symptomatic, that procedure. If a patient has a TIA, go with the carotid and arterectomy. If patient has anastomy, go with the cabbage. If patient has both simultaneously, then probably it's a good justification to yes, do a combined indeed. procedure. But in board exams, I know you have the Dean of CPSP sitting here as well. <laughs> I don't know what your board exam questions are, but in America, the classic teaching is that you do a stage procedure. Most commonly recommendations are because the risk of stroke is higher Agreed. in combined procedure. Yes. But uh, definitely we've, there are patients I think who would benefit. we probably have good results from a very, very long period from 94 till now. So that's why we've just stayed in the yeah. combined set and we've not. Well, congratulations on the outcomes. Yeah. Great outcomes for Thank sure. You. Well, the Dean of CPSP has to make a confession that the last time I did a combined procedure was 2009. <laughs> and after that, we stopped it. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how we can debate about it yeah. uh, with the recent advances in intervention most of the people go for carotid stents, in, yes. stents if they are symptomatic and if they are not we just go for surgery thank you and, and especially the fact that the combined procedure carries a higher mortality although in your series yeah. it was it was fascinating but but yes thank you very much huh? thank you Last but not the least, after which we should break for a cup of tea. Aortic root surgery in marfanoid patients. Dr. Obad Ali from Punjab Institute of Cardiology, Lahore. Dr. Obad. Thank you very much and a very good morning to all of my colleagues. Uh, today we'll be talking about aortic root surgery in marfanoid uh, patients and our experience at Punjab Institute of Cardiology, Lahore. Well, obviously no financial <coughs> revelations and these all cases were presented after written consent of the patients. Uh, before embarking upon our presentation, a brief history about our department that it was established in 2016. And since then, 138 procedures have been done with the age of patients ranging from 16 to 70 years. A total 48 Marfan syndrome patients with aortic dissection and aneurysms have been treated with Bental procedures. Out of these four cases, uh, four cases that have been operated in the last two months are being presented here. Uh, coming to our first case, the patient with an aortic root dissection that involved right common clotted artery. A 22-year-old male patient presented in an emergency with complaint of chest pain and shortness of breath. And the pain was such an intensity that it was not uh, relieved with any sort of analgesia. Well, his vitals were normal and ex examination was unremarkable, except that he had morphonoid features, having tall, thin build, disproportionately long arm legs, along with positive wrist shine. Echocardiography showed a dilated aortic root with severe AR, along with a tri-leaflet uh, aortic valve with aortic dis uh, dissection in the ascending and descending part 
with dissection flap protruding into the aortic root. CT aortogram was performed that showed aortic annulus of 27, aortic root that was measuring of 68 millimeter, while ascending aorta measured 71 by 73. Aortic dissection was seen starting from the aortic root and uh, sparing the ostrea of the left main stem, but ostrea of the RCA was compressed by the dissection flap. Along with that, the dissection flap was seen extended up to the right common <coughs> clotted artery. As you can see, a uh, clear picture of the uh, dissection flap that is being uh, extended right up to the right brachiocephalic trunk. Coming on to our procedure. For arterial cannulation, right femoral artery was cannulated, followed by a standard midline stenotomy, and uh, 250 ml of hemorrhagic pericardial fluid was drained. Uh, dual <coughs> bival and vis cannulation was done and cardioprimary bypass was established, followed by cross clamping of the aorta and routine uh, fibrillation. Aorta was incised and integrated cardioplegia was given. Aortic false lumen was identified along with preparation of the coronary buttons. Well was evaluated and excised. Ethibon 2 plagiated sutures were passed around the aortic annulus and valve size was re-evaluated. A Decron aortic valve conduit of 27 mm was selected for replacement. Coronary buttons were re-implanted on Decron graft, followed by deep hypothermic cardiac arrest for evaluation of right brachiocephalic trunk involvement. Cross clamp was off, right brachiocephalic trunk was found in the false lumen, completely transected. Retrograde cerebral perfusion was established. A PTFE graft was selected for interposition grafting. Distal anastomosis of the aortic graft was done, followed by reapplication of the cross clamp, reinstitution of the cardiopulmonary bypass, followed by de airing. Anastomosis with proximal end was completed, and de airing was done. Gradually, patient was weaned off from cardiopulmonary bypass, and routine hemostasis and routine closure was done. Patient remained eventless in uh, early post op period, and his INR was gradually built up from 1 to 2.5, and he received a total number of five post op transfusions. Post op CT autogram was done that showed bileaflet prostatic aortic valve, and most importantly, minimal collection around the prostatic aortic root with a patent conduit from aortic arch to the brachiocephalic trunk. Coming on to our case two, another dissection and Marfan syndrome. 25 year old patient presented an emergency with typical symptoms. Echo showed a dilated aortic root and ascending aorta. Dissection flap was seen in the ascending aorta with a non coapting aortic valve, causing severe AR. CT aortogram showed dilated aortic root and proximal ascending aorta. The maximum dimension of the aortic root was 72 into 74. Aortic <coughs> bifurcation was normal, and dissection flap was seen in the distal aortic root. These were the power of findings immediately after uh, midline stenotomy. And uh, after uh, routine uh, cardiopulmonary bypass institution, uh, aneurysm was excised and routine uh, coronary buttons were pre prepared. Decron graft is being seated. This is what it looked like after the completion of operation. Post op CT autogram was done that showed bileaflet valve seen at the aortic position with normal mobility during a CT sign NGO. Patient remained eventless in the early post op period. INR was built up and he was discharged on the 10th post operative day. Aortic dissection in a Marfan syndrome with ejection, ejection fraction of 26%. 58 year old female presented an emergency with complaint of chest pain and shortness of breath. Echo showed aortic aneurysm with strong suspicion of dissection. Intimal flap was seen in the ascending aorta just above the left coronary cusp, a dilated LV cavity, and ejection fraction of 20 to 96%. CT autogram showed aortic annulus of 21 and a dilated aortic root measuring 60 millimeter with effacement of sinotubular junction and a pear shaped aortic aneurysm with uh, maximum dimension of 75 in its uh, with localized dissection flap and normal trifurcation. These were the power of findings as you can see how thin walled and how fragile the aortic root looks like. And uh, here, as you can see, aortic uh, aneurysm was excised. And this is how the aortic uh, valve looked like, along with the preparation of the coronary buttons. Followed by the seating of the decron valve conduit. Post-op recovery was uneventful. Seven post-op transfusions were being done in total. 
and patient got discharged on the eighth prostrative day. Again, post-op CT autogram was performed that showed a normal functioning bileaflet prosthetic mechanical metallic valve. Moving on to our last case, aortic aneurysm that was massive in a patient with Marfan syndrome. 35-year-old young patient presented in our emergency with typical symptoms of chest pain and shortness of breath for last 72 hours. Echo showed a massively dilated aortic root with type A aortic dissection. CT autogram, as you can uh, see how massive it was with maximum dimensions of 110 into 104 millimeter. A linear focal dissection flap was seen in the aortic root. This is how it looked like after midline sternotomy. And then routine coronary buttons pr uh, preparation was done, along with setting of the Dacron valve conduit. This is how it looked like after the completion of uh, proximal end anastomosis. CT autogram was done that showed uh, uh, bilifluted metallic prosthetic valve at the aortic position with normal movement of both leaflets. His post-op recovery was also uneventful, and he got discharged on seventh post-op day. Coming to our experience, Bental operation provides an appropriate functional result by resolving the lesions of ascending aorta and root. In addition, most importantly, early presentation of Marfan syndrome patient with aortic dissection is a key in post-op recovery and survival. Based on our experience, appropriate training for the Bental procedure is necessary to gain such a level of confidence and experience to acquire better results for long-term survival. Uh, in the end, I would like to acknowledge the efforts of my head of department, Professor Amash Shabasab, in providing support and data for this presentation. Thank you.
पीछे हट जो दूसरी तरफ बनाया कर ना
as there is no moderator here so we are going to start it yeah what Uh, uh, Majid, can you hear me at the back? Okay, okay.
Okay. Uh, can we start now? So we have a less uh, participants, so uh, we need to wait. Uh, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Uh, Mansoor for uh, moderator. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Muhammad Mansoor Tarek, a resident cardiac surgeon at PIC. So we'll be beginning our session. So I want to invite Ms., uh, Dr. Zara Shirazi from NICVD on comparison of out, uh, outcome of OPCAB and ONCAB. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Have you ever wondered why some heart surgeries involve chopping the heart entirely and while others are performed on a beating heart? In the realm of cardiac surgery, the choice between the on-pump and the off-pump cardiac surgery are the two crossroads of a critical decision. Understanding the choice is not just about surgical technique, it's also about shaping the path to recovery for countless individuals battling heart surgeries. Within few seconds, within few minutes, we are going to explore the mechanics of both off-pump and on-pump cardiac surgery. Here's a comparative analysis of on-pump and off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting. And I have no disclosures. I am Dr. Zara Shirazi. Uh, our objective was to compare the outcomes between off-pump and on-pump coronary artery bypass grafting. We know that it's a surgical procedure we, uh, we use to treat coronary artery diseases. The aim is to restore the normal blood flow either through the on-pump or either through the off-pump. We know that cabbage is a significant treatment option for patients with severe coronary artery diseases, especially in those patients which, uh, when medication and lifestyle changes, uh, are insufficient. Even it can enhance the quality of life as well as prolong the expectancy. So let's discuss first of all about the on-pump coronary artery bypass grafting. We know that there are advantages of every procedure as well as disadvantages. So first of all, advantages. On-pump cabbage provides a stable and controlled environment for a surgeon. We can do complex surgeries, multiple grafts, but obviously the complications, that is the systemic inflammatory response system, we cannot deny that. And there are also complications related to blood disorders. Now let's talk about the off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting in which the advantages include obviously no complications that belong to the heart-lung machine. And if we look at the uh, uh, considerations that are the complications, we can see that there are some certain challenges a surgeon faces in doing complex surgeries during the off-pump. If we consider both together, then uh, on-pump is mostly preferred in cases requiring multiple and complex grafting, while off-pump is chosen those patients with higher surgical risk and having con uh, contraindication for heart bypass lung machine. So it's an exciting era and advancement in cabbage is required. We are focused on improving patient outcomes, reducing the complications and tailoring the treatments on individual needs. We divided the patients into two groups. That is the group A, which included the on-pump cabbage patients and the group B, which included off-pump coronary artery bypass patients. And what we saw, we saw the outcomes. And there were five parameters in we saw that as a duration of mechanical ventilation, it was the difference of the time between when the patient was ventilated and off ventilation. Second thing we saw was the ICU stay and then the hospital stay, the number of days the patient remained in the hospital. Then there uh, was a parameter of renal complication we observed in those patients and the mortality we observed in those patients. Now, before beginning of our study, there was a hypothesis that off-pump coronary artery bypass had better outcomes as, with, as compared to the on-pump. The materials and methods we used was the randomized control trial, and it was done at our uh, institute, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. There was six months interval. Approval was done for synopsis on October 10 till 9th April 2021. 
the total calculation of sample size was 188 patients were taken. A detailed history was obtained from the patient along with the consent. And the patient's data was compiled and analyzed with the SPSS data. Now the sample collection. We had an inclusion criteria which included patients 40 to 75 years old and either gender and the patients presented with coronary artery disease. There was also certain parameters in the exclusion criteria that included those patients who do not give consent, those patients who presented with cardiogenic shock requiring emergency surgery, and patients having concomitant cardiac procedure and the history of a stroke. Now, the data collection was started after the approval of the ERC committee of NICVD as well as from the CPSP. Now, here is the data analysis and the results. The age of the patients, mean age of on pump was 58.9, while off pump was 63.3. The ICU stay on pump was noted to be 47 hours, while that of the off pump 33.4. Hospital stay, 12.6 plus minus 3.8 days on pump group, while 10.9 in the off pump group. We observed the renal complications, that's where 44 patients had in the on-pump group, while 30 patients in the off-pump group. If you look at the mortality, there was two patients expired in the on-pump group and one patient in the off-pump. And the duration of ventilation on-pump and off-pump was 19.6 and 18.3 respectively. If you look at these analysis and results, uh, this was the performa we used. And the result was that there was no significant difference was noted between the outcomes of on-pump and off-pump. If you look, go back and look at the analysis of these uh, percentages, we can easily see that off-pump proved to be better in all aspects, but even the biggest trials are not achievable in the result that either is better. So uh, uh, according to the percentages, there was no significant difference between the two modalities. So let's discuss about it. Cabbage using a bypass with a cardioplegic arrest or pump with a standard procedure of surgical revascularization or we do with the off pump. Our aim is the same and we want the patient's good benefits. Since the development of on pump, it was developed in 1960 and then reintroduced again in 1990s, we expected to reduce the SIR, that is the main hurdle in the on pump surgeries. But what we see that despite its promising results and several RCTs have failed to demonstrate any significant difference in mortality, stroke, MI, and neurenal failure. We very well, we know that the Ruby trial, while it was all, uh, I don't want to discuss about that, after the dose trials, coronary trial, GOPCAP trial, Danish trial, all trials uh, said that both the parameters were equal. In theory, organ damage resulting from bypass and SIRS uh, are well avoided by adopting of PEM. We cannot deny this. In institutions with experience of on-pump, the rate of major advanced events and the rate of complete reverse and graft patency have been similar than the on-pump. These positive results have been called into question by reports of inferior graft patency in certain studies, as well as higher rates of repeat target vessel revascularization associated with off-pump. In conclusion, I want to say that uh, we want more studies and we want larger sample size. Obviously, we, were, uh, we had very small sample size. More parameters are needed. And I want not only the public, but the private sector hospitals in Pakistan also needed to validate these findings. So my conclusion is the aim of our study was to provide valuable insights to comparable outcomes of on-pump and off-pump. And the results contribute to the ongoing discourse of the cardiac surgery. Thank you. Okay, uh, one of the things about the on-pump versus off-pump cabbage, uh, it is a long debate, but uh, in the recent era when the economic conditions of Pakistan has gone to deliberation, we have seen a surge in the off-pump surgeries. This is true. But like, then one ethical question arises, does saving an oxygenator or uh, uh, saving a, a few thousand rupees values for a life? Because we all know that the potencies are not that great as they are within the classical on-pump uh, arrested heart patients undergoing the surgery. 
Uh, off pump surgery requires expertise, and we uh, have good results in those hands which usually do in large volume centers. So obviously the patients, we cannot compromise on that patient with these oxygenators or anything. So uh, my panel will tell better. Well, uh, it has been a very interesting and long debate, uh, but we have to remember two things. Number one, it has always been driven by economic considerations. Even when the oxygenators were cheaper, friends from uh, India, they used to come and tell me that uh, they are doing, say, about 95% of the off pump. They would tell us quietly, or uh, whisper us quietly, that yes, we want to save the price of the oxygenator. Number two point, that uh, we all know as far as symptomatically patient will be treated, but number of grafts is relatively lesser in off pump. Yes, symptoms, you put a, a good IMA, patient will most of the time will be asymptomatic. Uh, having said that, there are a few points which we have to consider. You see, as compared to off pump, on off pump is more fascinating for the youngsters, but there is a bad learning curve as compared to on pump. So before switching over to or attempting uh, this off pump, one has to be properly trained and be a safe surgeon. Never hesitate to consider a patient for uh, on pump. If you have planned and you open it up and you find uh, diffuse disease, uh, thin vessels, as we have in Asians, and with the um, seventy uh, percent incidence of uh, diabetes in our patient, so uh, I think never hesitate to switch over to on pump rather than going in uh, emergency and converting it to on pump surgery and then having IABP. IABP is equally expensive nowadays. I'm told it's more than two hundred thousand. A patient with a selecting a patient for on pump or off pump, the major issue is basically economically driven. We all know this. Okay, we all are like getting sites that off pump is equally good as on pump, but I don't think it's the case because had it been the yeah. case, the the large trials would have supported this years ago before us because we are like following the trail almost five decades like period we are having with the end. Uh, let's see. The other thing is we. We are all aware of this fact, and we do believe in this thing, that the Asians are known for the bad coronaries. So if we are known for the bad coronaries, and if the results are not good, and the Western populations who have got like on the average size of a lady, which is stenosed, and then the distal one is more than two and three mm, while we are just barely getting one and 1.5 mm. So how could our results be equally good to the on pump? I guess we need to look into this beyond the oxygenator price as well. Yeah, agreed, fully agreed. Any any other question? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Rightly, because uh, this is a very big controversy between provinces as well. Because in the sin, there's no high volume of off-pump cap as compared to the on-pump cabbage. We all are doing uh, on-pump cabbage because we have no a big financial issue. Because in the sin, uh, all the government sectors are doing free of cost cardiac surgeries, open heart surgeries uh, b with uh, uh, every variety. But the people uh, uh, like we are doing in the private sectors, we have a financial issue. But that's why in the sin, the off pump cabbage is not uh, much more uh, practiced as compared to the Punjab. The people of Punjab, they are dependent on the Sihat card. So there is a, a less amount uh, uh, in the Sehat card as compared uh, to the expense of hospitals. So they are doing according to the them, according to them that we have equal results uh, with on pump and off pump cabbage. But, but we are not happy as compared to the on pump cabbage because on pump cabbage is a very safe because we all are looking for the maximum revascularization to give long-term survival to the patient because our patient, uh, our cabbage is survived on the long-term basis. So that's why it is a big controversy in Pakistan, but in uh, like in India, 
they are doing on the basis of the uh, financial issues. So they are, or uh, they have no any learning curve because every center is doing the off pump cabbage on the behalf of the uh, financial issues. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, for that purpose, yeah. So this is the back end cent. I'm uh, uh, only tell you that we prefer to the on pump cabbage because we have a very good results taken as compared to the off pump cabbage. So, uh, with KPK, it is there is another point. You are getting more patients who are basically Caucasians, white races from Afghanistan and parts of KPK. But uh, in Sin, there are very few of them who come all the way to Karachi or all the way to um, Punjab. Still, people are coming. So whenever we have um, a person coming from, uh, uh, say, Afghanistan, uh, we feel so happy. And, <laughs> and that, that is the real player for the, uh, for the surgeon himself. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to add one more thing that off pump is now only has importance in porcelain aorta. Even in the uh, COPD and patients, it's to be indication according to recent guidelines. Thank you so very much. Achha, uh, uh, Dr. Zara, in the old guidelines, there are the three indications for the uh, off pump cabbage. As we have learned and uh, trend that uh, in the porcelain aorta, yep, uh, which have a previous stroke, renal failure, and uh, uh, blood diathesis. For that purpose, the people were using the uh, off pump cabbage, but now they are excluded. There's no any criteria for off pump cabbage. Only the people are doing the off pump cabbage in the porcelain area to reduce the uh, uh, cross clamp and uh, whatsoever, which is a risk factor for a stroke. Excuse me, Dr. Sam. Excuse me. Sir, I have a question. I'm Dr. Maria Matik from Tabahar. But, uh, sir, I just want to say there are some studies in which uh, it shows the patient who, those who, uh, who underwent cardiac surgery and uh, their long term survival. So, those who uh, have low perfusion time or cross clamp time have high survival rate. So, I think it supports, uh, it supports the off pump cabbage as compared to on, on pump cabbage. So, what's your opinion on that? Yes, I think uh, people who have long clamp, cross clamp time, we are not um, in questioning the ability of the surgeon. It varies from surgeon to surgeon. But uh, prolonged cross clamp time means complicated disease, difficult anastomosis, maybe thin vessels, maybe endarterectomies. They are bound to have a shorter lifespan expectancy. And uh, people, uh, if you, you perform a, a procedure, say, within uh, 8, 10 minutes, one anastomosis, 10 minutes, and three anastomosis, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, then um, that means you are dealing with most probably a straightforward uh, distal vessel. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Zara, for such a nice presentation. Actually, we are running out of time, short of time. So uh, our next participant is Dr. Zeshan Afzal from PIC. Uh, he'll be presenting on cabbage with LV dysfunction. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Zishan Afzal and uh, I am a resident cardiac surgeon at Peshawar Institute of Cardiology. And uh, today I am going to present uh, a study on uh, coronary artery bypass grafting in a patient uh, with left ventricular uh, dysfunction uh, that were presented at PIC. So the objectives of our study were to determine the outcomes of the patient uh, that were going a uh, coronary artery bypass grafting with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, the study design was a retrospective observational study and uh, it was conducted at Peshawar Institute of Cardiology uh, from August 2021 to uh, my uh, August 2021 to my 2022. So all those patients uh, that was having coronary artery disease uh, undergone for cabbage, 
having ejection fraction less than 55 percent uh, they were the part of our study and those patients uh, that have ejection fraction more than 55 uh, those was having a uh, valvular and congenital surgeries or reopening they were excluded from the study so we conducted this study on total uh, 120 patients uh, who were admitted with us for cabbage with mild to severe left ventricular dysfunction and uh, we have taken the uh, approval from the hospital ethical approval committee so basically uh, our study was actually totally based on the um, stage trial study and uh, CASS trial study. So um, I will not go in details because uh, I'm expecting everybody knows about these trials. Uh, but uh, in stage trial, um, there were 280 patients sample. Um, they actually compare the patient uh, with the cabbage surgery, with medical treatment or SVR surgical ventricular restoration. And uh, after that, they have compared these patients uh, their, with their outcomes. And those patients um, that was having cabbage along with medical treatment, they have uh, uh, better and improved long-term survival uh, as compared to the patient uh, that was having just a medical treatment. And also those patients uh, that was having a cabbage along with surgical ventricular restoration, they have a decreased uh, rate of death and uh, repeat hospitalization due to cardiac events. But at 48 month follow-up, uh, there was no significant difference in the primary outcome, uh, for example, death or uh, rehospitalization due to cardiac issues or uh, chances of stroke, uh, symptoms like angina and shortness of breath. Uh, similarly, uh, the coronary artery uh, surgical study trial uh, was conducted on uh, 780 patients. Um, uh, that was a randomized trial. And that was a study uh, on the patient. The patient was randomized into two groups with the medical treatment alone and the medical treatment plus cabbage. And uh, uh, those patients that has undergone cabbage, 10-year uh, survival were much more improved. That was about 80% as compared to those patients that have medical treatment alone. That was 59%. So, so in our study, uh, uh, our results were basically based on the clinical characteristics of the patient. Uh, clinical presentation of the patient and uh, post-operative outcomes. So the results were actually based on the certain parameters of the patient, like mean age of the patient, mean cross claim time, bypass time, mean hospital stay, mean ICU stay, the clinical presentations of the patient, uh, the patient with the ejection fraction from mild to moderate to severe, and uh, uh, post-operative outcomes. So the association of the uh, left ventricular dysfunction towards the post-operative outcomes and clinical history or clinical presentation is significant association because of the p-value less than 0.05. So these are the baseline uh, clinical characteristics uh, with certain parameters that we have taken in our study uh, regarding age of the patient, uh, same as the cross-claim time and so on. Majority of the patient uh, in our study, they were hypertensive and diabetic. Some of the patients were having history of both hypertension and diabetes. Uh, some of the patients were having hyperlipidemia, a previous history of stroke, previous history of cabbage, previous history of myocardial infarction, and chronic renal insufficiency, uh, which I think they were in a very small percentage. <clears throat> Majority of the patient in our study, uh, they were presented with the shortness of breath and uh, chest pain. And um, some, of, some of the patients were having uh, other associated symptoms like sweating, uh, palpitation, vomiting, and uh, they were having burning sensation in the epigastric region. On the basis of the echocardiographic findings, uh, we divided our patients into three categories. Uh, majority of the patient were having moderate LV dysfunction. Uh, followed by severe LV dysfunction, and some of the patients were having mild LV dysfunction, that is about 21.70. Postoperatively, uh, majority of the patient developed atrial fibrillation, followed by some GI complications because of their, maybe some personal hygienic condition at the home. Uh, they were having pneumonia, they were having acute kidney injury, uh, they were having readmission uh, because of the external wound infection. 95% of the patient in this study, uh, they were stable, they were discharged home on oral medications, and about 5% were having mortality. So 
Coronary artery bypass grafting is uh, extensively used for the treatment of the patient with the left ventricular dysfunction. Although uh, medical treatment uh, is also effective for such patients, but our su studies suggested that left ventricular dysfunction, uh, they have association with the post-operative outcomes and clinical presentation of the patient. So these are this, uh, some association of the LV dysfunctions towards the outcome uh, in terms of the hospital stay, ICU stay. Uh, post-operative complication and other clinical presentation, uh, which is quite significant. There are a large number of studies and uh, researches and trials uh, on LV dysfunction. Uh, I have just put some of the recent researches uh, that have been done on the same topic. Uh, the first one study is the, uh, uh, they have been conducted in the King Abdullah Medical City Hospital in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it showed that uh, the patient uh, having LV dysfunction, uh, they have uh, improved survival rate, they have improved uh, uh, survival outcomes. Uh, and uh, these patients, uh, for example, if these patients undergone for cabbage, there are certain mortality predictors for these patients, uh, and such patients need a special consideration. And that uh, mortality predictors are their diabetic diabetes level, uh, their uh, uh, LV uh, diastolic dysfunction and uh, perioperative insertion of intraatic balloon pump. So these are cer certain predictors uh, that can affect their mortality rate. Otherwise, there was a significant improvement in their LV systolic dysfunction, uh, systolic function. The second study is a, a study that has been published in the Dove Medical Press in the UK. And this study is actually a, a comparison study between PCI and cabbage uh, in a patient with coronary artery disease uh, having moderate LV dysfunction. And in, in, according to this study, uh, those patients having moderate LV dysfunction and coronary artery disease, if they underwent PCI or cabbage, they have improved LV function at uh, three month follow up. But the thing in this study is those patients having PCI, they have lower short term mortality that is 30 day mortality as compared to the patient with the cabbage. But, but in PCI patient, they have repeat chances of revascularization as compared to cabbage patient. The survival benefit mortality, that is same, but the PCI patient have repeat chances of uh, revascularization. So this was all about presentation. Thank you. Any questions amongst the audience? Uh, Zichan, uh, it's very, very nice presentation. Uh, I have got a question for you. So uh, you presented the outcome of a patient who has got LV dysfunction. Then you divide it in, in three groups. One is mild, moderate, and severe dysfunction. Is there was any difference in these three, three groups, the outcome? Exactly. Uh, there was a difference uh, uh, we have observed, as I mentioned in my uh, last slide, uh, in terms of hospital stay, especially those patients, uh, they presented with us with the NYHA class 3, anginal pain, CCS class 2 or 3. Uh, they were in the um, uh, like uh, severe LV dysfunction, but those patients have much more longer hospital stay and ICU stay, sir. Right. Uh, another question. Those patients who have got poor LV dysfunction, uh, do you routinely do uh, myocardial viability? Uh, cardiac for MR. those patients? Yeah, sir, yeah, yeah, MR. yeah, of course, sir. Um, if, if we are suspecting the patient, like uh, if the patient presented to us with severe LV dysfunction and the patient is having signs and symptoms of the heart failure, so definitely uh, we preferred uh, the cardiac MR for those patients just to check the viability of the LAD, circumflex, and RCA. And if the myocardium is viable, the territories are viable, you know, after that, then we proceed for the surgery. Any sir. patient needed intraortic balloon pump? Uh, in our study, sir? Yeah. We ha I think, sir, we haven't uh, included that factor in our study, sir. But that is important, sir. Thank you for a well-worded presentation, Dr. Zishan. Uh, I guess uh, one of the comment about this is like if we come across a report that is showing an LV of 30 or 25 percent, 
the most concerning thing is how much are the LV dimensions and how much are the other dimensions, whether there is a concomitant disease or not, whether there are kinesias or hypokinesias and in what region they are. I guess that would be like putting a new debate into question because most of the cardiologists and even most of the surgeons do not like the CMR or viabilities. But I firstly believe being trained in FIC, we, were, we would be looking into LVs whose dimensions are out of range, who are having some other pathologies as well. And particularly if there are kinesias in the interior and the interior receptor areas, then we would be going for viability studies. If the dimensions are okay, if there are no echinesia, it's just hypo to echinesia or hypokinesia, then we can take a bit of a risk with the, the most we can do is like just put in an extra arterial line. If you need to put in an IBP, you can put in an IBP later on. But if you doesn't need the revascularization, the heart comes up to life. Yeah. Well, so it's all fine. That was just a comment for you. And this is this is just a question. How many of us are putting uh, prophylactic uh, IABP uh, preoperatively in a patient who has severe LV dysfunction? Generally, generally, what is uh, the, what is the routine here in at least in Peshawar or in uh, PIC? Anybody who can. So, uh, at one stage of my uh, practice, uh, I did start it uh, if there is a patient uh, with poor LV uh, to put antarctic balloon pump pre-op and then. Uh, but I think at some stage then I did stop it and I don't use it not, uh, anymore. But I do put uh, uh, arterial sheet and every time to be ready if needed in ICU to put the balloon in in our hospital setup uh, majority of our surgeons uh, looking into the patient lv if uh, we have patient with ejection fraction less than 30 percent or 25 percent even so prophylactically we just put the femoral sheet or intraatic balloon pump and we admit that patient in the icu for close observation and after one day or two then we uh, uh, shift that patient to the OR for session. Uh, sir, I would uh, like to add about the poor LV. We are using at our center prophylactic uh, intraiotic balloon pump actually, but uh, there is always a uh, selection for uh, the patient. Uh, I think we are more uh, inclined towards when the patient is having persistent angina plus akinesia and uh, uh, severe LV dysfunction, and we have to operate upon him. And I have seen a much more benefit of putting an IABP 12 to 24 hours before in terms of angina. If the patient is having persistent pain, it recovers very well and the perfusion is very good and you can proceed for surgery easily. And what about the centers where the antriotic balloon pump could not be passed? Because not all the centers are having antriotic balloon pump. That is one thing. Not all the people can afford it. That is another thing. It all depends upon the management. It all depends upon the um, uh, expenses. If you can afford, you can have to. You can have an ITC set up uh, to manage the IBP preoperatively and for longer times. Then you can very well proceed with that. Well, um, some controversial thing I'm commenting. At NICVD, there was a time when we were short of money. Everybody, we, we couldn't buy IABPs, so uh, uh, balloons. So what we started doing, take all the balloons intact, clean them, re-sterilize them, and then we reported a total of, I think, 78 patients who were saved in casualty, in CCU, as well as in surgery with those reuse of IABP um, because of ethical and other consideration and the people would uh, just kill you. <laughs> that is why uh, we stopped doing it, but I think this is something doable. And in our uh, circumstances, you see, problem is that um, with the newer generations, we don't see what our elders have done. Uh, I belong to a very primitive <laughs> antique generation. Um, we had, we didn't have uh, three way stop cocks. They were actually metallic and we used them. 
we did not have um, aortic cannuli. We did not have uh, other cannuli. And they were all metallic, and we used to use them. Then uh, when there was a time when we started cardiac surgery in Pakistan, uh, we usually had, and those were bubble oxygenators, by the way. You couldn't have a pump time more than two hours. What we do, what we did at that time, that we took two patients, both the patients blood compatible, both the patient their all the 10 um, uh, uh, units each, all the relatives compatible, uh, donors compatible. And with one pump, we would operate two patients with one oxygenator. So uh, we never had those um, uh, uh, hep uh, hepatitis B or C or these infections. Patients survived, patients were benefited. Now, in uh, taking the same example, in um, uh, 2008, we started using these IABPs, reuse of uh, balloon pump, balloons. Uh, you see, this uh, hepatitis B virus is killed at a temperature of 80 degrees, 70 degrees centigrade. And uh, C is also a protein and killed at uh, 70, 75 degrees centigrade. When you wash them, clean them, uh, do a proper uh, procedure with ethylene oxide, what uh, the parameter we developed, our own parameter. This is this is more, I, I said it's controversial, but it's thought provoking. So we developed our own parameter to use these things. Uh, at a given time, we would have three balloons for one patient, use balloons. And so that if one ruptures, so immediately we can put another one. And uh, we never needed uh, a, a second balloon. And with the same balloon, we saved lives, not only in operation theater, but in casualty as well, and casualty and uh, CCO as well. So this is more thought provoking than, uh, uh, than uh, I think, uh, in a modern era, where there are so many limitations, limitations, your litigations are there, um, media is there, everything is there. But uh, I think there, there are certain things which are doable. Thank you. Uh, opening the femoral artery and then... Both ways. Whatever yeah. the way. Both ways. Uh, one thing more... Uh, because Initially, we used it's to a larger in, sheet. In, yes. in Belfast, when I went there, we used to open method the balloon, put the balloon in. And there we did use the basket, the steel basket for putting it into the right atrium. Yeah, yeah. Steel basket, I have been using it. Yeah, we, uh, when Belfast in late 90s, when I yeah. went there, we yeah. used all of them, they used crystallite, carubigia, and the basket. And yeah. for the wire, it was just a piece of piece of wires and with a hall, you know, mochi yeah. jo use karte. Uh, we had to, and the spoon see, to put the you, spoon. Uh, you see, I'm not suggesting that we start doing no, these no, things, I, but this has to be a thought provoking thought thing. Provoking. That, uh, there, there are ways. certain things. There well, I guess are. these days our finances demand those things back. Yeah, Connection. yeah, tailor made. <laughs> Sir, so I would like to add uh, something. At uh, IMI, we have also this experience of used balloons. So many used balloons we uh, uh, in aortic balloon pumps. Uh, wow. Regarding presentation, I would uh, like to add something else that uh, we are talking about poor LV function and coronary artery disease. There is very clear evidence that revascularization will improve the ejection fraction. But so, I think uh, we should look into that as well, that that improvement or uh, derangement is because of revascularization or something else like medication, like collateral development. So I think whenever we are going to study about that, so we should be having a very clear cut uh, demarcation of what is moderate, what is uh, severe and what is mild. And the other thing is that reversibility of myocardium, actually these are the segments which are important and that should be demarcated, documented by the viability scans and there should be some follow up period. And after that, post-op viability scale should also be there to see the reversibility that how much segments are improved actually. 
then even we can just say that this was because of revascularization or medication or collateral development. So I think in any study, viability scan should always be involved. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you for Thank you, Dr. Zishan, for a nice presentation. So our next participant is Dr. Ali Guhar from PIC on fate of tricuspid regurge in patients undergoing mitral valve replacement. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Dr. Ari Gaur, uh, resident cardiac surgeon, uh, Peshawar Institute of Cardiology. Uh, today, uh, my topic is very clear, uh, fate of tricuspid regurgitation in patients who are going uh, mitral valve surgery. It's a retrospective coherence study. Uh, functional tear uh, due to mitral valve diseases, should we repair it or not? at what condition we should repair it and what the technique associated with it. Uh, background, uh, whether functional TR should be repaired at the time of mitral valve surgery. Surgery is controversial. Durability of tricuspid ward anoplasty remains still unknown. Uh, this is just a TB disease burden, like uh, severe TR is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. The overwhelming majority of tricuspid surgery is performed uh, during left-sided warp surgery. 37% eventually develops severe TR following rheumatic warp replacement. 74% uh, have severe to moderate TR three years after ischemic mitral repair surgery. 8.8 uh, .8 to 18% mortality for severe TR following mitral warp replacement. Only 40% five-year survival. 1.6 million live with moderate and severe TR in the US. Our objective is to determine the frequency of tricuspid valve repairs in conjunction with mitral valve replacement and technique used for it. To determine the severity of TR on follow-up echoes and its association with the technique used for repair. To determine the in-hospital and 30 day mortality. A study design is retrospective current study. Uh, Study setting is cardiac surgery department, Peshawar Institute of Cardiology. Duration is like almost three years, less than three years. Uh, sample size is 166 patients, I think I provide taken. So uh, we divided the patient into four categories. One, who have the severe TR in which the tricuspid was repaired. Second group was moderate TR in which the tricuspid uh, valve is rep repaired. And third is moderate in which the tricuspid valve was not repaired and third mild tier in which the tricuspid was not repaired. Inclusion criteria is all the patients were taken which were above 18 years old and which have the structural mitral valve disease with tricuspid regurgitation. Exclusion is primary tricuspid valve regurgitations. Combined procedures, the one who combined with cabbages, AVR plus cabbage plus TV repair plus uh, patient operated only for Tricuspid regurgitation with no mitral valve disease. These are exclusion credit and complete medical records. Data is corrected from EMR. And then these patients were followed prospectively for 18 months through HMS and hospital visits. So total uh, 195 mitral valve surgery was performed in which functional TR was in 166 patients. Uh, among, uh, among 166, there are 46 patients who have a mild TR in which their tricuspid was not repaired. Mordes was 71. Out of 71, 44 patients were those in which the tricuspid was repaired, and 27 in which tricuspid was not repaired. And severe, all the severe tricuspid regurgitations, their tricuspid was repaired. Uh, no, uh, I took the one group. These groups are those who have the severe TR in which their tricuspid was repaired. So uh, I divided into four follow-ups, one at the time of discharge, second six months, next 12 months, and a fourth is 18 months. So you can see that like uh, at the time of discharge, 98% has a trace TR after their tricuspid was repaired. And then gradually, gradually, 
tricapsid uh, went into severe. 44 percent of those patients in which their uh, severe TR in which their capsid wall was repaired and they have the severe TR. Second group was those in which uh, P baseline was moderate and their tricapsid wall was repaired. So uh, till 12 months, 85% have the stress TR. And after uh, 18 months, they are 25% of those patients in which they went into severe TR. Uh, it is a group in which uh, their tricapsid was not repaired, but the baseline was moderate TR. So at uh, 18 months, 52% were those patients who went into severe TR. And 37 was those patients who were in moderate TRs. This is a mild TR in which trichopsia was not repaired. So at 10 months, only 11% went into a severe TR. Rest are pretty much good. So uh, these are the outcome of social endoplasty versus a ring endoplasty 18 patients. I, I feel like it is not a true uh, like, uh, compar comparison between the social endoplasty and the ring because there was only 12 patients in which the ring endoplasty was done uh, due to uh, SSP, Surat Sayat card, because we don't have any funds. So this one only was done with the, uh, the patient who have the severe TR. So uh, 37 patients after 18 months in which suture endoplasty was, divaga was performed and they went into 37 per severe TR. Conclusion, we need to do a more uh, tri concomitant tricapsular valve surgery should be considered in patient with moderate TR. Uh, concomitant TV during the process checks for accident durability for preventing progression of TR. Patient was limitations or patient was followed by the limited time period. Wrong term mortality and mobility was not assessed. Uh, this was a single center study. So uh, data was influenced by typical bias. Uh, clinical and post com transthoracic eco follow up was incorporated in some cases. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Any question? Well, um, my concern is you had a uh, number of patients who had mild TR at the time of surgery. You did not do anything naturally because so, you thought it was not required. But 18 months down the stream, a good number had either moderate TR or severe, severe TR. Years. How do you uh, check that? How do you comment sir, on that? Yes, sir. Uh, these patients were, uh, we did a divaga on these patients, and that's why I did the comparison between no, the I'm divaga. talking about uh, mild one. Yes, sir, mild, mild. mild. you didn't do anything. Yes, sir, we do, didn't do anything. And still they develop TR sir. after uh, 18 months. Yes, sir, after 18 months. Sir. So. You see, this is the message which I have learned after so many years. Any tricuspid valve which is annul where annulus is larger than 32, 35, 34 millimeter, he's bound to develop TR, whether you find a TR preoperatively or not whether you find a TR during surgery or not, but they are bound to develop TR uh, within a year or within, a, within two years because they have uh, higher PA pressures, they have higher, um, larger size RVs. So it's whether you find TR, and this, that is the hypothesis, and that is where we are working on that, that whether you find TR or not, just reduce the annulus to its proper size. And what is the proper size? I know the guidelines, they advocate that anything above 40 millimeters should be reduced. But what we think that if whole body flow can go through 31 millimeter mitral valve, it's a high pressure system, then it should be able to go through 33 millimeter, just add two sizes up, two millimeters add two millimeters to the tricuspid valve and that should be enough. So if you are putting a mitral valve of say 27, then 29 would be enough in tricuspid position. And we are performing divegas. And uh, 
my second question is, when you said you are performing De Vegas, what is the size, uh, uh, final size of the annulus when you reduce it? Sir, it uh, should be less than 40. So again, you are supporting my Sir. hypothesis that anything above 35 is bound to develop a tricuspid regurgitation. And unfortunate thing is, re-stenotomy, tri severe tricuspid regurgitation, none of the surgeon is ready to operate on that patient. Sir. We started doing uh, at NICVD and we actually presented our data. Any valve, we were, I, I have been doing mitral valves through left atriotomy and then we started doing transeptal just so that we go uh, um, uh, and check the tricuspid valve as well. So every patient in uh, NICVD, all my lists, we started reducing the annulus, whether they had TR or not, to two uh, millimeter higher than the prosthetic valve we had used in mitral position. If you have used say 27, we reduce it to 29. If you um, put a mitral valve 31, we reduce it to 33. And uh, we presented our data of uh, 140, 150 cases in each group. And uh, people who had this repair, uh, just two patients had TR. And those were the two patients. One of them had SBE and the other one was not performed properly. That was during our learning curve. The rest of the patient, none of them came with uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Regurgitation sure. post operative. Thank you so much. Any comment, question? Per operative echo and uh, then uh, post op regular three monthly echo. I have been following them for the last um, some of them 10 12 years and uh, no TR so far. Thank you, Dr. Ali. So our next participant is Dr. Muhammad Zaid Ali from RMI on the topic of an overview of aortic surgery at a tertiary care hospital. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Zaid and I'm a resident cardiac surgery at Himan Medical Institute, Peshawar. Uh, I will present an uh, overview of uh, our aortic surgery case series uh, in our institute we have done. Uh, so coming towards the brief introduction, uh, the two most common pathology of aorta, for which intervention is needed in some form, uh, are the aortic aneurysm uh, and number two is the dissection. Uh, the, regarding site involvement, uh, the most common site involved is the abdominal aorta, followed by ascending aorta in the arch and the descending aorta. Uh, looking toward the global mortality uh, for the aneurysm, so it ranges from 1 lakh 50,000 to 2 lakh patient per year. Well, the operative mortality for the aneurysm ranges from uh, 5 to 10%. Uh, similarly, uh, the incident of isolated dissection is 5 to 30 cases per million per year. Uh, uh, same way, the operative mortality in the acute dissection is also very high. It's about 19 to 32 percent, uh, while it's also high for chronic dissection, which is about 15 to 20 percent. So uh, the primary objective of our study was uh, to determine our in-hospital mortality. Uh, the secondary objective we were looking for uh, to look for our ICU stay, uh, prolonged ventilation duration, and the blood product uh, transfusion. Uh, so uh, it was a retrospective study uh, and the data was collected uh, from our database uh, from 2017 to uh, 2023, over a period of seven years. Uh, in all those patients who underwent aortic surgery, both elective and emergency and both open and endovascular repair, they were included in our study. Uh, and the total number of patients were 73. Uh, this uh, slide shows you the uh, procedure we performed on the route ascending aorta in the arch. Uh, so we did a total number of uh, 43 root replacement in which 
pre-patient diet. Uh, we did uh, five root reconstruction plus ascending aorta replacement uh, in which we had one mortality. Mm, we did six ascending aorta replacement with interposition graft. Uh, we had no mortality in that. Uh, we did a two ascending aorta plus hemi arch replacement and we also had an, any mortality in that. Uh, and we did three arch repair in which we had one mortality. Uh, this next slide shows you the procedures that were performed on the descending aorta in the abdominal aorta. Uh, so we did a total number of three open descending thoracic uh, aorta repair in which one patient died. Out of uh, these three uh, descending thoracic, uh, uh, we had uh, two patients which presented with the aortoenteric fistula. Uh, we did a total number of five uh, open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. We had no mortality in that. Uh, we did two TUR. Uh, we also have no mortality in that. We did uh, three aortofemoral grafting uh, without any mortality. And we did one EUR uh, without any mortality. Uh, out of these 73 patients, uh, we had a total number of six in hospital uh, mortality. Uh, regarding the secondary objectives, uh, our mean ICU stay was 56.4 hours. 16.2% uh, of the patient had prolonged ventilation, that is uh, greater than 24 hours, and 63.3% of the patient required blood or blood product transfusion. Uh, I will share a few cases uh, with you. Uh, the first case, uh, it was a huge aneurysm of the uh, Ascending aorta, the root, and the proximal arch. The ascending aorta was about eight into nine centimeter. Uh, these are the intraoperative finding. You can see the large uh, aneurysm. Uh, what we did in this patient, we did an uh, on pump, uh, on pump uh, with arterial cannulation, the femoral artery. We did deep hypothermic circulatory list. Did a bental ascending aorta and hemi arch replacement uh, with the crown graft. This is second case. This was a case of uh, descending aorta pseudoaneurysm uh, at the level of ligamentum arteriosum. This patient had a history of an RTA and presented to our ER. Uh, uh, according to the ER protocol, we did a whole body CT uh, and we noticed, uh, uh, you can see uh, a dissection uh, just below the subclavian artery. Uh, what we did in this patient, we did a TUR uh, with coxenith alpha graft uh, for about uh, 10 centimeter. Uh, you can see the graft uh, we put in this patient, and also you can see the post uh, post operative image after uh, deploying uh, the graft. Another case, uh, uh, this was an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, this was a 70 year old male uh, with COPD, high risk, uh, with multiple uh, abdominal surgery. Uh, we did EUR in this patient. Uh, you can see the preoperative image of huge aneurysm and the post after deployment of the stent. <clears throat> Coming towards the conclusion, aortic aneurysm and dissection is a complex and high risk disease with both open and endovascular options available. Uh, and you need a hybrid OT need to conduct open and endovascular repair. Thanks, any question? Any question? Well, very impressive. Uh, you had a long series and uh, with very good results. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any questions, please? No one? Thank you, Dr. Zaid. So our next participant is Dr. Majid Usman from AKU on the topic of feasibility of coronary and arterectomy for diffuse coronary artery disease. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Majid Isman, cardiothoracic surgery resident from Khan University Hospital. Uh, honorable panelists and dear audience, first of all, I would like to thank respectable organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my experience regarding coronary and detrectomy in diffuse coronary artery disease. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So dear audience, as we know that diffuse coronary artery disease is a challenging form of a heart disease, and it's often characterized by the long 
continuous or multiple atheromatous plaques, and this often make the conventional techniques of revascularization impossible. So if you look at the literature, it's been observed that if these patients are left untreated, their mortality is as huge as 60%. And when it was compared uh, between medical and the surgical arm, the medical arm had a mortality of 14%. So talking about some non-conventional techniques by which we can revascularize this patient includes the plaque avoiding techniques and the plaque manipulation techniques. So when it comes to plaque avoiding techniques, these include multiple, multiple grafts. It can be a sequential graft. It can be a composite graft. So when it comes to manip plaque manipulation techniques, it can be a long segment anastomosis across the disease. Uh, it can be plaque, plaque exteriorization technique or coronary endotrectomy. So having talked about diffuse coronary artery disease, coming to our topic of coronary endotrectomy. So dear audience, as we all know that coronary endotrectomy is removal of the atherosclerotic core from the vessel lumen through an arteriotomy. So historically, it was done by Charles Vele, even before the cabbage in 1957. Then Longamere uh, refined further the procedure using the open direct vision technique. And then came along the Senning in 1961, who did it on pump using circulatory arrest. So when is the coronary artery indicated? So when there is a diffuse disease that's involving the vessel and its side branches, when there is no adequate place for anastomosis, that's not even allowing the one millimeter probe to pass through. So coming to the techniques, it can be done with the open technique and the closed technique. So the open technique is the one in which we, op we do the arteriotomy all the way, and then we remove the plaque under direct vision. And the closed technique is we make a small arteriotomy, and then using the technique of traction and counter traction, and we try to pull through the plaque. So coming to the anastomosis, uh, anastomosis are done using two techniques, either direct anastomosis or using the vein patch and then anastomosing the lima or the vein grafts. So the anastomosis technique depend upon the length and the caliber of the graft and similarly the length of the lesion of the native vessel. So depending upon these circumstances, you can use either of these techniques. So there are some challenges that are associated with coronary endotractomy, and that's the reason that some of the surgeons avoid coronary endotractomy. And, and those results from two phenomena, the one is a snowplow effect. So if the surgeon is a young surgeon and had, doesn't have adequate experience, or if the surgeon uh, is not patient enough, so he might pull the plaque rapidly, and that's result in the shear effect. And the plaque break and it dislocates into the branches, side branches are deep distal into the vessel. Number one, the second phenomena which results is that uh, the endotrectomy is not mere removal of the atherosclerotic core. It also, with removal of the atherosclerotic core, the intima is also removed. And this result in the exposure of subintimal components. And that's highly thrombogenic and that results into uh, early graft failure, early graft occlusion. So the rationale of my study was to assess the outcome of coronary endotrectomy in diffuse coronary artery disease, or in other words, to assess this old tool for our new problems that we are encountering more often these days. So the objective of the study was to assess the morbidity and mortality within 30 days of cabbage plus coronary endotrectomy. Uh, it was a cross-sectional retrospective study that was done at our section of cardiothoracic surgery at our Khan University Hospital. Uh, our sample size was calculated to be 78 on open epi software, uh, having the confidence interval of 95%. So these were our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So talking about the results, so our mean age in our study was 58, and uh, most of the patients, that's 90% of the patients were male, and our population was slightly obese, and the BMI of 27 was observed. So talking about the comorbids, so two-thirds of our patients had diabetes and hypertension, and 
uh, when it comes to the pre-op uh, intraoperable, so most of the patients that underwent and me were elective, and that is around 90% of the patients, and most of them had three or more than three coronary artery disease. So talking about the vessels, so the vessel that received the maximum endotrectomy was the LAD, followed by the RCA and followed by the circumflex. So our outcomes were reopen was observed in 5% of the population, prolonged ventilation time that was more than 24 hour was observed in 12.5% of the patient, pneumonia was in 3.8% of the patient, Fib was observed in 6.3% percent of the patients, similarly deep SSIs, leg wound infection in 1.3 percent of the patients. Mortality, that was 30 days mortality, was 2.5 percent, and our uh, mean length of stay was six days. So our conclusion was concomitant cornea and artrectomy in isolated cabbage is feasible and safe procedure with early outcomes when where there is no alternate for sufficient revascularization. So yes, our, patient, our study had certain limitation. It was that it was a single, single center. It was a retrospective design. It was a small sample size, and we observed only short-term outcomes. Our study did have some strength to it, and it was the assessment of the sample was then the pre-study. And uh, uh, it's one of few studies from the region, and the data from the existing medical record was used, and it was EFC-approved study. So our way forward is that we should look further research should be done to determine the long-term outcomes of the coronary endarterectomy and in, in these patients. Thank you. Any I have uh, one question. What was uh, your uh, uh, technique of uh, endarterectomy? Is that was so mostly, mostly you were open or yes, you were using closed one? Yes. Mostly and the open. second one is what was your protamine protocol after that? Yeah, sure. So mostly open, uh, and the LED is almost always hundred percent open. When it comes to RCA, mostly open, and some of them, some of it is uh, via closed technique. When it comes to the protamine technique, so yes, we follow the protocol of full, uh, full reversal heparin, uh, followed by aspirin six hours if the patient is not bleeding, and then keeping that patient on dual antiplatelets. And yes, when it goes to medical literature, there are two schools of thought on it. The one is the way that we are doing it, and the other one is the partial reversal or not reversal of the heparin, and the start of anticoagulation that's happening in initial, initial days, and then continuation of the protein for three to six months. So, yes, these are the two things. Warfarin. Well. Warfarin, sorry. Sorry, warfarin. Uh, and you were using post-op heparin infusion? No, we did not. We, we gave aspirin six hours post uh, after the surgery. Okay. I think uh, talking about the south patient, you uh, have to have uh, open endotrectomy because of the very smaller vessels. And it is uh, most of the time very difficult uh, by doing closed endarterectomy, and you may be able to uh, proceed for total endarterectomy using closed technique. So we are uh, doing that. We are having very diffuse and small coronary patients, and most of the time we are using only patches and lima over the patches, and we are using open technique only. Thank you, Dr. Majid. So our last participant is Dr. Sajid Khan from Northwest General Hospital on the topic of outcome of cabbage in patients with LMS disease. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim My name is Dr. Tahir Iqbal. I'm working as senior registrar in Northwest General Hospital in the Research Center at Peshawar. 
my topic for presentation is outcomes of cabbage in patients with left main stem disease okay as you all know that uh, left main stem disease is a higher prognostic risk factor because around the 75 percent of myocardium is at risk in left main stem disease and it is not uncommon in stable patients undergoing coronary angiography in routine and uh, current guidelines recommend revascularization for all those patients with uh, more than 50 percent involvement of left main stem regardless of their symptomatic status though multiple rcts has been carried uh, between pci and cabbage among left main stem patients but still cabbage is a gold standard for revascularization in these patients and it is class one recommended both in american heart association and european guidelines in our hospital we did a retrospective study of on pump cabbage patients with significant left main stem disease that is more than 50 percent by diameter uh, between 2020 to 2023 out of 900 patients 22.7% of patients presented with left main stem coronary artery disease more than 50% in these patients 39 uh, 30.9 patients had previous history of angioplasty and 39% has re had recent history of myocardial infarction these patients were highly symptomatic and you see 44 percent were having angina class 3 or 4. there was a high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension in these patients and we had to operate these patients as urgent basis you see 90 percent patients were operated on urgent basis and this is the baseline properties uh 78.4 percent were male age mean age was 60 years and range ranging from 14 to 83 this is an interesting history about this child 14 years of uh, age uh, his uh, sister and this patient was operated by uh, his uncle and father was operated by professor rahman sahib and the child and her sister was operated by dr nia sahib in our institute uh, they belong to a family of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia uh, then diabetes 55% 42% hypertension and 68% uh, of patients were having uh, good or fair lv function while 31% were impaired lv 30% of patients had previous angioplasty the, regarding coronary angiography findings triple vessel coronary artery disease was present in 95.6 percent along with left main stem disease involvement between 50 to 70 percent in 49 percent and 24 percent between 70 to 90 and more than 90 percent the critical left main stem disease in 26 percent of population 88 percent led 68% uh, left circumflex and 60% in RCA territory. Operative uh, details, 90% of patients were operated on urgent basis. 68% uh, of patients received three grafts, while 11 and 20% received two or four grafts re respectively. Our mean cross claim time was 40 minutes and uh, bypass time was 73.41 minutes left internal thoracic artery was harvested in 99 percent of patients uh, 96 percent of these patients received lima to led in eight patients uh, 3.9 percent a cephanous venous graft was anastomosed to led uh, then the lima was anastomosed in these cases to nearby big uh, diagonal or uh, the ramus vessel 
the reason was uh, diffusely diseased LED or small size LED or endochromized LED. So we put LED, a lemma to a big diagonal or RMS. Coronary endotectomy was performed in 9.3% of cases. Median ICU stay was 45.5 hours and hospital stay was six days. This is the median value. Uh, 4.9% of patients required reopening and we had 2.5% mortality in this group. Majority of patients, there was no major complications and 10% of patients, we, they have some post-operative complication in the form of reopening, prolonged ventilation, prolonged inotropic support, post-op MI, low cardiac output syndrome, Intraortic balloon pump was inserted perioperatively in four patients, that is 2%. And the four patients, 2%, we observed stroke. One patient required dialysis for stage three acute kidney injury. And 1.5% in patient, we had sternal wound infection. So the conclusion and my message is that left main coronary artery disease is not an uncommon condition because myocardium at risk needs need urgent surgery. So we have to prioritize these patients in our sehat card and general list in the current economic and financial scenario. So also taking advantage of this forum, I have we our institute has designed a study that is comparison of post-operative ventricular dysfunction, uh, ventricular function after cabbage between left main stem and non-left main stem in left ventricular dysfunction. We were talking uh, a bit earlier about this topic. This study has been designed so that we can answer the pre and post-op left ventricular dimensions, viability before surgery, uh, revascularization, the completeness of revascularization, intraortic balloon pump, and the comparison between viability and respective revascularization. So the pre-op and post-op and between non-left mainstream and left mainstream patient will be, will be uh, there will be a comparison. And uh, we want it to make it a multi-center study. Inshallah, uh, this study will be carried out in all hospital of KP. Outside of the KP hospital may participate in this study. Uh, interested uh, faculty members can contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think a nice presentation. Uh, with that, I think uh, there is no more paper. Acha, you you are coming. Presenter or quiz? Right, right. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening so patiently for the last session, and uh, thank you very much. And I think now over. Uh, sir, we will we will have a just a, a shield distribution and certificate distribution right. ceremony right now. So I would like to invite all the panelists on the stage, and uh, uh, Sir Dr. Azam Jan Saab. So please, sir, come on the stage, and uh, sir, Dr. Niaz Ali Saab, please, sir, come on the stage. I will request all the panelists as well to come on the stage. Uh, I would like to invite uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Zara Shirazi from NICVD. Uh, uh, her topic of presentation was uh, comparison of outcome of op cap and on cap surgery. So, please, madam. Now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Ali Gohar from Peshawar Institute of Cardiology. Uh, 
His presentation topic was fate of tricuspid regurgitation in the patient undergoing mitral wall replacement. Dr. Muhammad Zaid Ali from RMI. Uh, uh, his topic of presentation was an overview of aortic surgery at a ter tertiary care hospital. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Majid Usman from Aga Khan Hospital. Uh, his topic of presentation was feasibility of coronary in artectomy for diffuse coronary artery disease. Now do, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tahir uh, from Northwest General Hospital. Uh, his topic of presentation was uh, outcome of cabbage in patient with uh, lift main stem disease in our hospital. Uh, okay, uh, I will invite Dr. Zishan Afzal from Peshawar Institute of Cardiology. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. Aftab wants to show us a deployment of aortic stent right now. So uh, if you, those who are interested can uh, wait and observe uh, for the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Thank you. Dr. Aftab, you want to come here? Thank you. 